the actions of the Trump presidency revealed the dishonorable fact of the president's betrayal of his oath of office, betrayal of our national security, and betrayal of the integrity of our elections. Therefore, today, I'm announcing the House of Representatives moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. It's a joke. Impeachment for that? This is live coverage from The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. At the top of the hour, the acting director of national intelligence, Joseph McGuire, is scheduled to testify in open session of the House Select Committee on Intelligence. This caps off a tense week on Capitol Hill. Speaker Nancy Pelosi said on Tuesday that McGuire will have to choose whether to break the law or honor his responsibility to the Constitution. That dramatic language comes on top of the speaker's decision to launch an official impeachment inquiry into President Donald Trump. Well, with me now to walk us through how we got to this remarkable political moment, my colleagues Matt Zapatowski and Tulu uh, Orinu, excuse me, I'm so sorry, Tulu. Um, uh, guys, we just got, we just got uh, this uh, whistleblower complaint released from the chairman of the Intelligence Committee. It just got posted online. Matt, you've been like going over it with a <laughs> yeah. fine tooth comb. Um, we'll get to that in just a moment, but I want you both to go over with me first how we got here and what we're actually expecting today. Well, yeah, we got here because a whistleblower in the intelligence community complained about a matter initially that we didn't even know what it was about, just filed some complaint. Normally, complaints like that are kind of routed to the intelligence, uh, uh, intelligence committees, excuse me. This went to the inspector general. Normally, the inspector general is supposed to give them to Congress. In this case, that didn't happen. Uh, the Justice Department got involved because the Director of National Intelligence asked them to look at this. They decided it didn't need to go to Congress. The Inspector General nonetheless told Congress about the existence of this. They got very upset that it didn't go to them. It sparked this whole chain of events that in recent days has led us to learn much more about the complaint. Today we got the complaint itself and learn that it stems from this very controversial phone call President Trump has with the Ukrainian President, essentially asking him to launch an investigation of Joe Biden, his political political rival. So that's kind of the complicated backdrop. Joe McGuire, the director of national intelligence, is being called to Capitol Hill today to talk about why didn't you, you know, hand this over to Congress like Congress felt you were supposed to. What was happening here? Until you covered the White House, this is uh, an, an acting director of national intelligence. He's only been in the job for a few months' time. Can you give us a sense of what we know about his relationship with President Trump and President Trump's team? Well, we know that he is in place in part because the President Trump and the administration uh, basically got rid of the other leaders of the, 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 the intelligence uh, community. We had um, uh, previous... We had Dan Coates Yeah, we had leave. Dan Coates, and then his, uh, his underling, Sue Gordon, was also supposed to fall into that place, but then President Trump and his administration put pressure on her to basically leave and allow President Trump to put someone who he thought would be more loyal or, or more, much more of a team player into that position. It did turn out in this case that McGuire felt that the situation was so dire that he had to actually take this to Congress, even though the administration was trying to keep this out of the public sphere, trying to keep this phone call under wraps. There's even information within this whistleblower complaint that alleges that the administration put the information about this phone call on a separate uh, electronic system uh, separate from where phone calls normally go be in, uh, allegedly because they did not want this information to get out there did, they did not want a lot of eyeballs on this phone call because uh, they must have thought that there was something wrong with it and now that the phone call has been released there's all sorts of recriminations you have Democrats saying that it is clear that the president was trying to pressure a foreign government to interfere in the 2020 elections and that's why we're heading toward uh, this process of impeachment mm. Our colleague Rhonda Colvin has been reporting live from Capitol Hill all this week. So let's go to Rhonda. Rhonda, what have you been hearing this week? A lot has transpired this week, and we've been throughout the halls of Congress in the Capitol talking to lawmakers as things have developed in this Ukraine scandal case in real time. People have been telling us their take on this, what they believe this means, and on the Democrat side, it means impeachment. It means that this is a very egregious uh, case where the president has had misconduct. He has had a, uh, a conversation with a, another world leader that was inappropriate, and a lot of Democrats feel that this is a very 
clear case for impeachment and that they're going to hear from the DNI right now and they will decide what they will do next. On the Republican end, we've heard very differently. We've heard that they think that, the, that this is no case for impeachment, that this will go nowhere after today, and this is simply how world leaders conduct business. So take a listen to two lawmakers that we spoke to yesterday, right after the transcript was released, and hear their take on this. This is the United States of America. We're, we're a country of laws that, uh, you know, we expect our leaders not to involve themselves in criminal uh, investigations or ask other countries to investigate their political opponents. That's just, that's third world, uh, you know, country, that's, that's how third world politics uh, is run, not in the United States. So if we want to reduce ourselves uh, to that, you're opening up a Pandora's box, and that's not America anymore. To me, it was never a quid pro quo. There was never any kind of threat. And uh, it was a very free-flowing type conversation. Anyone who knows President Trump knows that issues sort of run into each other. If you do look at the uh, totality of it, apparently the president never asked the Justice Department to look into the Joe Biden matter. Uh, the Attorney General said that today. And uh, to me, this is a conversation that you can have between two leaders. So that really illustrates what we've been hearing all week from Democrats and Republicans. Very different views on this uh, Ukrainian conversation. And uh, we'll see more and hear more in the hearing that's about to take place down the hallway from me. Now, one of those people you just heard from is Eric Swalwell. He also mentioned to us, he's on this committee, he mentioned to us that he thinks this is a watershed moment. He thinks that this will open up other whistleblowers who will come forward and discuss Trump's handling of intelligence matters and his conversations with world leaders. So he'll be one that you'll probably want to listen to as this hearing takes place in a few minutes. We're also going to hear from Adam Schiff. Uh, he's the, the chair of this committee. And just to give you a little bit of background on this committee, it's smaller than some of the other one, other hearings that we've covered. Uh, this is uh, only 22 members sit on intelligence. And what I'm hearing from committee aides is that they are going to get a standard five minutes each to question the DNI today. And then this might wrap in about two hours. But of course, we, we can't say that in confidence. You just don't know what's going to happen here in Capitol Hill. But I will be inside the room and I will uh, return back after this is all over and tell you what I'm hearing from in the room. Libby. Rhonda Colvin, thank you so much. Um, Rhonda brings up a great point. We really don't know exactly what to expect from this hearing, although we don't anticipate it going very long today. Do we know how much the DNI will really say, Matt? I mean, could he just repeatedly say, I can't talk about that? He could, but so much has been declassified and is out now. Like just reading through this whistleblower complaint, the complaint itself has some kind of classified appendix, but the whole letter complaint is unredacted and there for anyone to see. I don't know how he couldn't address questions about that. The phone call, an actual sort of rough transcript of the phone call is out now. I don't know how he could really get away with politically just saying nothing. Matt Zapatosky, Tolu Alurunapar are my guests, and we're previewing what's about to start in about less than 10 minutes' time. The Director of National Intelligence, the Acting Director, uh, testifies before the House Intelligence Committee in this open session. We'll bring it to you live and un uninterrupted. Okay, so we just got this whistleblower complaint. Everyone's been clamoring to see it. Um, I know you guys have had about two minutes to look over it, but are you seeing anything that stands out to you yet? Tolu, what are you seeing? Uh, I think that after we saw the transcript yesterday, we got the, the, the bulk of the information, but this... So by transcript, you mean the, the, the readout and the phone call that President Trump had with the Ukrainian leader. Right. That's and transcript is like... Transcript makes me think of something that's an exact word-for-word right. -word description of what this was, was said. This was more but of a summary a sum slash readout yeah. with some back and forth about what happened uh, during the call. So that is, it does seem like that is the focal point of this whistleblower complaint. It seemed like the whistleblower decided to make this complaint after seeing that call, but there's a lot more in this complaint that's beyond that call that tries to paint this broader picture of how President Trump, his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, really tried to pressure the Ukrainian government to investigate Joe Biden, to investigate the 2016 elections. Uh, this is a new president coming into Ukraine, and it seemed like President Trump and his lawyer were very fixated on making sure that this person was, in the words of this whistleblower, willing to play ball with President Trump's own personal political ambitions. And that really stuck out to me, how much pressure was put on the Ukrainians, not only uh, the fact that this happened during this phone call, but also, you know, the, the broader effort by the Trump administration to try to cover up what was happening, to put this phone call and the transcript of this phone call in a separate electronic system to separate it from the normal process. And then the second thing that, s that stands out to me is how many U.S. officials were disturbed by this. This is a whistleblower that seems to be representing several U.S. officials who came to them with information, not that this person had, you know, 
firsthand information about a lot of this, but they said that multiple U.S. officials, multiple White House officials came to them with concerns about what the president was doing, and that, and that shows that if this impeachment process goes forward, there are a number of different people who could be brought to testify to talk about why they were concerned, why what the president was doing was concerning. And these aren't the president's enemies. These are people who are working for the White House, working for the administration, and those are the types of witnesses, if we look back at the Nixon era, those are the types of witnesses that can be the most compelling because they're not seen as, you know, enemies of the president. They're seen as insiders who were so concerned that they had to bring this these concerns forward and a whistleblower decided to put them in writing. That's such a great point. You know, we did see Corey Lewandowski he testify recently before the House Judiciary Committee, and President Trump thought it was a win. He was just talking yesterday about what a great guy Corey Lewandowski was and what a good job he did, um, or at least this week he was talking about that. It, it devolved into a bit of a circus. And so when we talk about some of the president's own allies or people who worked for him coming forward, Democrats have to be careful, Matt, in terms of are they there to get information? Are they there to do politics? And could the, could the politics of it, the atmospherics of it, ultimately backfire? Um, Adam Schiff is the chairman of this committee. We can see people coming into the hearing room now. Uh, do we have a sense of, of how he wants to run the proceedings today? Well, I don't think uh, Joseph McGuire is going to be like Corey Lewandowski. Corey Lewandowski came in ready to rip. He's one of the president's strongest allies. Joseph McGuire is a, a man who has a pretty good reputation. He formerly directed the National Counterterrorism Center. You know, he's been thrust into this role because he's kind of the last man standing. But I think you can see in his public statements that um, he's in an uncomfortable spot here. You know, he reached out to the Justice Department. It felt like because he genuinely didn't know, should I hand this over? Should I not hand this over. It wasn't like he was, he is a part of the administration, but it didn't seem like he was ready to roll with exactly what the president wanted. My colleague Shane Harris and others reported yesterday that he actually threatened to resign if this if this situation didn't get resolved. So I imagine Democrats want to get facts from him to figure out what happened, what was exactly was the Justice Department's advice to him, what did he want to do, and we'll see how many of those facts he's willing to reveal. If you want to read the whistleblower complaint, you can find it on our website. Just go to WashingtonPost.com and we've got it posted there. We don't know who this person is yet. No, we don't. Uh, even the Justice Department doesn't know who he is yet. They evaluated this sort of complaint, and there's no kind of signature here. I think the Inspector General does know who he is. We have some context clues, right? So he doesn't have firsthand knowledge of this call, but he, it almost sounds like there's a situation where lots of people in the office are talking about the boss. They're concerned about the boss, and this guy is kind of their ambassador, or this person is kind of their ambassador. He's compiled all these complaints. He heard about the phone call. He heard about a possible effort to keep it from being accessed by a lot of people. So he, representing all of these people who complained to him or her, uh, came forward. Um. Tolu, yesterday the White House put out talking points, which is a typical thing to do, right? Every administration does this. They put out talking points suggesting what Republicans could say to defend President Trump and defend the White House. They also sent it to Democrats. And so Democrats were quick to put it out there, tweet about it, um, criticize it. What did we learn, though, from those talking points that the White House accidentally gave to the other side as they try to figure out how to deal with this situation? Well, they are saying the president is completely vindicated and exonerated by this transcript, which wasn't really a transcript, but the summary of this phone call basically saying that there was, there was no quid pro quo. The president was not explicit in saying you, you will not get military aid in Ukraine if you do not pursue my political opponents with an investigation. It wasn't quite as explicit as that. The president said, you know, I want you to do me a favor, and the president talked about a number of other things on the call. So the White House tried to use the information that was in the summary of the call to exonerate the president by saying it wasn't an explicit act, ask for information based on the fact that the president has control over hundreds of millions of dollars in military aid that the Ukrainians wanted. Now, the Democrats are not buying that. They're saying this is an implicit quid, quid pro quo because the president is saying, we do all this for Ukraine, we're a very good ally, we need a favor, and these are the things that we want. And at the same time, the president is withholding military aid in a sort of uh, unexplainable way. No one has really been able to describe why the uh, military aid was suddenly held back. This whistleblower complaint says that he heard that it was because the president specifically ordered that the military aid be held. And the fact that it was held shortly before this phone call is something Democrats are going to seize upon to try to make the case that the president was using this as leverage to try to push the Ukrainians to pursue Joe Biden with a political investigation at the same time that he was holding back money that had been appropriated by Congress. So that's going to be a focal point, I think, of the, these hearings going forward. 
you know, I want to talk about this question of military aid that goes to Ukraine, um, because there has been reporting now uh, that the Pentagon didn't didn't see a need to hold back this military aid for the reasons that President Trump is, is laying out to us, Matt. Yeah, and a couple of my colleagues, I think you have the story up there, reported that President Trump kind of personally ordered this to be held back. This wasn't kind of just a bureaucratic wrangling that happened beneath him and he didn't know about it. He personally was involved and his motives for that or his stated motives for that have changed. So it's very curious. I think the White House hailed this call as a win because Trump doesn't explain Explicitly bring up that aid in the call. Um, but the call, everyone's kind of focused on this transcript issue. The call is dialogue. I mean, the call is there was a sort of text to type thing, like a voice thing on your phone. Officials reviewed it. They also took notes of actual dialogue. And you see Trump's actual words, which are really problematic. You know, even though he doesn't bring up, hey, I will give you this aid if you do this Biden investigation. It's very backslappy, kind of mobby. Would you do me a favor, though? Maybe you can have this White House meeting. And we know Trump's actual words, even though he doesn't bring up that aid in particular. The context is pretty clear. All right, great. So we're watching members of the Select Committee on Intelligence come into the hearing room now. We will bring this to you live and uninterrupted once it gets started. We'll also be here to provide some analysis with our reporters who've been breaking uh, stories about this um, as the hearing takes breaks, as it wraps up. We'll, we'll dive in and, and, and figure out what it all means. This is, uh, I was going to say separate from the track that Speaker Pelosi has put forward, this impeachment inquiry. Of course, it's all tied together. There, it's, it's all in the same web. But this is not part of the, this is something that's happening. Adam Schiff got this ball rolling. This is not an official part of the quote unquote impeachment process. Tulu. It, it's not official, but they are linked. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, to ex it's hard to imagine the White House releasing the summary of the call, releasing this whistleblower complaint if Nancy Pelosi hadn't gone ahead and said, we're going to move forward with impeachment. The, the position of the White House before this was, you don't deserve this call. There's no reason this is all privileged information. We don't have to hand over anything. And the White House had been stonewalling on other issues related to the Mueller investigation before. So the fact that Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats decided to move forward with an official impeachment inquiry does seem to be what opened the floodgate, floodgates to all this public information coming out. And they are linked, and that's part of the reason they're having this hearing, because you know the DNI was not expecting to provide information, and the, the House believed that it was in the letter of the law that they had to provide this whistleblower complaint. And they called for the DNI to come forward to Congress to explain what he was doing, to explain why he had not handed over this uh, whistleblower complaint within the amount of time set out by the law. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why we're in this impeachment situation now. And it's really all linked together. And I imagine that this is going to be the first of many hearings, and many people within the Intelligence Committee are going to be treating it that way as sort of a pre-impeachment type mm -hmm. hearing. Uh, and it's going to be uh, highly rated and watched all over, in part because it's seen as the first uh, the first salvo in this long uh, impeachment process that we're entering now. Tulu, what are you going to be listening for this morning as testimony gets underway? Uh, I'll be listening for, for just that, how many of the members of the committee are treating this as mm -hmm. an impeachment hearing, as a Nixon-type uh, televised hearing where um, you know people within the Trump administration are called up and asked under oath to explain what they were doing and why they were doing it. How loyal will McGuire be to the administration? He does seem to be like someone who wants to play it by the book and if the Democrats are able to ask piercing questions towards him they may be able to crack open some information that other witnesses have been either unwilling to provide or have been reluctant to provide because they are Trump loyalists so if McGuire is not seeing himself as someone whose job is to protect the president I mean we saw Attorney General Bill Barr ha have important hearings earlier this year and he definitely seemed like he was in place to protect the president he was defending the president against all kinds of different charges if McGuire is going to play that role it'll be inter interesting to see how that plays if he decides to play a more independent role and and, you know, potentially throw the president under the bus in some ways by just sort of, you know, being an independent um, party in, in this. Uh, that could lead to a lot of important information that the Democrats are trying to get out of this. So I'll be really paying attention to what kind of role McGuire decides to play and how the Democrats re respond to that. Okay, we're watching this hearing to see uh, who's coming in. Uh, it was supposed to get underway at 9 a.m. Uh, it's a little bit after 9, but we will head over there as soon as things get moving forward. Matt, what do you want to add on to what Tolu said about 
what to watch for this morning? And so really, what, what should we all be listening for? I, I mean, I think to his last point, I'm really looking to see what is McGuire's view on all of this. We know that McGuire made a criminal referral to the Justice Department based on the Inspector General's findings here. Uh, what is, how does he feel about this? The whistleblower feels that this was maybe the president using the power of his office to solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 U.S. election. Does McGuire worry about that too? What's his view on this? I mean, he is seen as someone who is kind of independent. So him coming out and saying forcefully, yes, this is a concern would be a big moment. And I'm also just looking for him to explore some more facts of this. You know, what were his interactions with the Justice Department like? Did he agree with the decision not to hand this over? What does he think about that now? What does he think about the Justice Department's legal reasoning? What were his conversations like? Were there any with Bill Barr? Were they sort of at a lower staff level? So I'm looking for his views on the situation and new facts that he can reveal. The Justice Department is is uh, uh, an important player for a couple of reasons <laughs> right now, including the fact that President Trump was talking about the head of the Justice Department in his phone call with the Ukrainian leader. Um, do we expect members to pick at that thread today? I mean, this is, this is not the Judiciary Committee, it's the Intel Committee, and yet there are a lot of questions about just what role the Department of Justice can and should be playing as things go forward, Tolu. Yeah, I would be surprised if that doesn't come up because mm -hmm. the reason that they did not want to hand over this whistleblower's report in the first place was because the Justice Department waited and, and basically overruled the Inspector General of the Intelligence Committee, Community saying, you know, we don't think this is an urgent concern, we don't think this has to do with intelligence. And, the and fact they stop it from going to Congress. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but, but, that, but that is key. And Congress does not like it on either side of the aisle when, when, when people withhold things from them and, and they're, they're not privy to the inside conversation. That's exactly right, and that's part of the reason they've decided to move forward with this impeachment inquiry is because they felt that they were being stonewalled. And when this uh, call summary came out yesterday and we saw that the Attorney General himself was somewhat implicated in this because President Trump said that he was going to ask the Attorney General to get in touch with the head of Ukraine to try to investigate Joe Biden and to investigate 2016, uh, it, it really causes Democrats to wonder why the Justice Department was withholding this Im information that in some ways implicated the Justice Department because the President called for the Justice Department to be involved. Now the Justice Department has said they did not take any action, they did not call anyone in Ukraine, they did not try to investigate Joe Biden as part of this process, but Democrats are going to be wondering why the, the Justice Department was taking so many steps to withhold this information from Congress at a time when this information was somewhat damaging to the, the, the reputation of the Justice Department because the President implicated them and said that they would be involved in investigating one of the President's chief political rivals. Matt, the role of the Department of Justice. Yeah, well, the handling of this kind of mystifies me because in part because it was held back is why this thing explodes. Mm -hmm. You know, the Justice Department keeps this from Congress and that is what so rankles Congress. Then there's all this reporting on what is the, uh, what's behind the whistleblower complaint. So first is that it involves President Trump. Then it's that it, it involves President Trump in Ukraine. And then it's that President Trump asked for Ukraine to investigate one of his political opponents and that's what puts pressure on them to just release all this. The Justice Department had simply turn this over to Congress as might have been normal, I wonder how differently it would play. Certainly Congress would be concerned about this, but there wouldn't be this undercurrent of something being covered up in a, in a drib drab. I mean, this guy isn't a direct witness. In some ways, if Congress got this and released it, President Trump could say, look, this is just a person who the Justice Department or the Inspector General has assessed as having some political bias who's out to get me. He didn't. He wasn't even on this phone call, but now he's been pressed to release this complaint in full, release the call in full, a, a call with a foreign leader in full for everyone to read his own words and that is what has made this such a scandal so I have questions even just politically on how the Justice Department handled this they have sought to explain this by saying look the complaint only needs to be turned over to Congress when it has to do with an intelligence matter. This actually had more to do with a possible campaign finance violation. So it's not the sort of thing that the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community really has jurisdiction over and certainly not jurisdiction to hand to Congress. I would say that the allegation that it is being stored in kind of a super classified area where it can't be accessed probably is more to the point of an intelligence matter. Uh, nonetheless, the Justice Department determined that wasn't the case, and, that, and that's why they say they didn't hand it over. President Trump uh, talked to reporters yesterday. Oh, I'm hearing the click of the cameras. Here we go.
we'll just watch the screen as we see the acting director of national intelligence come in and take his seat. Um, totally, before we go live to the hearing room, President Trump did speak yesterday with the leader of Ukraine, and he tried to downplay this. Yeah, the president wanted to hear from the president of Ukraine that he was not feeling pressured. Uh, and the president of Ukraine did say that, you know, you can look at the, the transcript of the call, there, there was not uh, a feeling of pressure ba place, placed on me by the president. Uh, you have to remember that the Ukraine still relies on a, lo a lot of U.S. aid, so uh, it, it's not clear how much he was sort of speaking from his heart versus uh, feeling like he had to say what would help the president of the United States. But that meeting was very closely watched and the president got a lot of questions and there was a lot of uh, interest in hearing what the president would say when he sat right next to the president of Ukraine uh, and whether or not he would push forward with his calls for investigating Joe Biden, which he did some of that yesterday as well. So it's clear that this is something that still is animating uh, the president's dealings uh, in a bilateral relationship with Ukraine. Tolu Olirunipa and Matt Zapatoski, our reporters here at the Washington Post, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be watching this hearing and we'll come in during breaks and as it wraps up to give some more analysis. Uh, you can see there, there, you can see there Joseph McGuire, the acting director of national intelligence, is seated at the dais. This hearing of the House Intelligence Committee will get underway in just a moment, so let's go to it live. The committee will come to order. Without objection, <clears throat> the chair reserves the right to recess the hearing at any time. The presidential oath of office requires the president of the United States to do two things, faithfully execute his or her office and protect and defend the Constitution. That oath, of course, cannot be honored if the president does not first defend the country. If our national security is jeopardized, if our country is left undefended, the necessity to faithfully execute the office becomes moot. Where there is no country, there is no office to execute. And so the duty to defend the nation is foundational to the president's responsibilities. But what of this second responsibility to defend the Constitution? What does that really mean? The founders were not speaking, of course, of a piece of parchment. Rather, they were expressing the obligation of the president to defend the institutions of our democracy, to defend our system of checks and balances that the Constitution enshrines, to defend the rule of law, a principle upon which the idea of America was born, that we are a nation of laws, not men. If we do not defend the nation, there is no Constitution. But if we do not defend the Constitution, there is no nation worth defending. Yesterday, we were presented with the most graphic evidence yet that the President of the United States has betrayed his oath of office, betrayed his oath to defend our national security, and betrayed his oath to defend our Constitution. 
For yesterday, we were presented with a record of a call between the President of the United States and the President of Ukraine in which the President, our President, sacrificed our national security and our Constitution for his personal political benefit. To understand how he did so, we must first understand just how overwhelmingly dependent Ukraine is on the United States, militarily, financially, diplomatically, and in every other way. And not just on the United States, but on the person of the president. Ukraine was invaded by its neighbor, by our common adversary, by Vladimir Putin's Russia. It remains occupied by Russian irregular forces in a long, simmering war. Ukraine desperately needs our help, and for years we have given it, and on a bipartisan basis. That is, until two months ago, when it was held up inexplicably by President Trump. It is in this context, after a brief congratulatory call from President Trump to President Zelensky on April 21st, and after the President's personal emissary, Rudy Giuliani, made it abundantly clear to Ukrainian officials over several months that the President wanted dirt on his political opponent, it is in this context that the new President of Ukraine would speak to Donald Trump over the phone on July 25th. President Zelensky, eager to establish himself at home as a friend of the President of the most powerful nation on Earth, had at least two objectives. Get a meeting with the President and get more military help. And so what happened on that call? Zelensky begins by ingratiating himself, and he tries to enlist the support of the President. He expresses his interest in meeting with the President and says his country wants to acquire more weapons from us to defend itself. And what is the President's response? Well, it reads like a classic organized crime shakedown. Shorn of its rambling character and in not so many words, this is the essence of what the President communicates. We've been very good to your country, very good. No other country has done as much as we have. But you know what? I don't see much reciprocity here. I hear what you want. I have a favor I want from you, though. And I'm going to say this only seven times, so you better listen good. I want you to make up dirt on my political opponent, understand lots of it. On this and on that, I'm going to put you in touch with people, not just any people. I'm going to put you in touch with Attorney General of the United States, my Attorney General, Bill Barr. He's got the whole weight of the American law enforcement behind him. And I'm going to put you in touch with Rudy. You're going to love him, trust me. You know what I'm asking, and so I'm only going to say this a few more times, in a few more ways. And by the way, don't call me again. I'll call you when you've done what I asked. This is, in sum and character, what the President was trying to communicate with the President of Ukraine. It would be funny if it wasn't such a graphic betrayal of the President's oath of office. But as it does represent a real betrayal, there's nothing the President says here that is in America's interest, after all. It is instead the most consequential form of tragedy, for it forces us to confront the remedy the Founders provided for such a flagrant abuse of office, impeachment. Now, this matter would not have come to the attention of our committee or the nation's attention without the courage of a single person, the whistleblower. As you know, Director McGuire, more so than perhaps any other area of government since we deal with classified information, the Intelligence Committee is dependent on whistleblowers to reveal wrongdoing when it occurs, when the agencies do not self-report because outside parties are not allowed to scrutinize your work and to guide us. If that system is allowed to break down, as it did here, if whistleblowers come to understand that they will not be protected, one of two things happen. Serious wrongdoing goes unreported, or whistleblowers take matters into their own hands and divulge classified information to the press in violation of the law and placing our national security at risk. 
This is why the whistleblower system is so vital to us and why your handling of this urgent complaint is also so troubling. Today we can say for the first time since we have released this morning the whistleblower complaint that you have marked unclassified that the substance of this call is a core issue, although by means, no means the only issue raised by the whistleblower's complaint, which was shared with the committee for the first time only late yesterday. By law, the whistleblower complaint, which brought this gross misconduct to light, should have been presented to this committee weeks ago, and by you, Mr. Director, under the clear letter of the law. And yet it wasn't. Director McGuire, I was very pleased when you were named acting director. If Sue Gordon was not going to remain, I was grateful that a man of your superb military background was chosen. A Navy SEAL for 36 years and director of the National Counterterrorism Center since December 2018. Your credentials are impressive. And in the limited interactions that we have had since you became director of NCTC, you have struck me as a good and decent man which makes your actions over the last month all the more bewildering. Why you chose not to provide the complaint to this committee is required by law. Why you chose to seek a second opinion on whether shall really means shall under the statute. Why you chose to go to a department led by a man, Bill Barr, who himself is implicated in the complaint and believes that he exists to serve the interests of the president, not the office itself, mind you, or the public interest, but the interest of the person of Donald Trump. Why you chose to allow the subject of the complaint to play a role in deciding whether Congress would ever see the complaint. Why you stood silent when an intelligence professional under your care and protection was ridiculed by the president, was accused of potentially betraying his or her country, when that whistleblower by their very act of coming forward has shown more dedication to country, more of an understanding of the president's oath of office than the president himself. We look forward to your explanation. Ranking Member Nunes. Thank the gentleman. I want to congratulate the Democrats on the rollout of their latest information warfare operation against the president and their extraordinary ability to once again enlist the mainstream media in their campaign. This operation began with media reports from the prime instigators of the Russia collusion hoax that a whistleblower is claiming President Trump made nefarious promise to a foreign leader. The released transcript of that call has already debunked that central assertion. But that didn't matter. The Democrats simply moved the goalposts and began claiming that there doesn't need to be a quid pro quo for this conversation to serve as the basis for impeaching the president. Speaker Pelosi went further when asked earlier if she would put brakes on impeachment if the transcript turned out to be benign. She responded, quote, so there you go. If the whistleblower operation doesn't work out, the Democrats and their media, we have candidates, quote, we have many candidates for impeachable offenses. That was her quote. So there you go. If the whistleblower operation doesn't work out, the Democrats and their media assets can always drum up something else. And what other information has come to light since the original false report of a promise being made? We've learned the following. The complaint relied on hearsay evidence provided by the whistleblower. The inspector general did not know the contents of the phone call at issue. The inspector general found the whistleblower displayed arguable political bias against Trump. The Department of Justice investigated the complaint and determined no action was warranted. The Ukrainian president denies being pressured by President Trump. So once again, this supposed scandal ends up being nothing like what we were told. And once again, the Democrats, their media mouthpieces, and a cabal of leakers are ginning up a fake story with no regard to the monumental damage they're causing to our public institutions and to trust in government. And without acknowledging all the false stories they propagated in the past, including countless allegations that Trump campaign colluded with Russia to hack the 2000 
2016 elect election. We're supposed to forget about all those stories, but believe this one. In short, what we have with this storyline is another still dossier. I'll note here that in the Democrats' mania to overturn the 2016 elections, everything they touch gets hopelessly politicized. With the Russia hoax, it was our intelligence agencies which were turned into a political weapon to attack the president. And now today, the whistleblower process is the casualty. Until about a week ago, the need to protect that process was, the pri was a primary bipartisan concern of this committee. But if the Democrats were really concerned with defending that process, they would have pursued this matter with a quiet, sober inquiry as we do for all whistleblowers. But that would have been useless for them. They don't want answers. They want a public spectacle. And so we've been treated to an unending parade of press releases, press conferences, and fake news stories. This hearing itself is another example. Whistleblower inquiry should not be held in public at all. As our Senate counterparts, both Democrats and Republicans, obviously understand, their hearing with Mr. McGuire is behind closed doors. But again, that only makes sense when your goal is to get information, not to create a media frenzy. The current hysteria has something else in common with the Russia hoax. Back then, they accused the Trump campaign of colluding with Russians when the Democrats themselves were colluding with Russians in preparing the Steele dossier. Today, they accused the president of pressuring Ukrainians to take actions that would help himself or hurt his political opponents. And yet, there are numerous examples of Democrats doing the exact same thing. Joe Biden bragged that he extorted the Ukrainians into firing a prosecutor who happened to be investigating Biden's own son. Three Democratic senators wrote a letter pressuring the Ukrainian general prosecutor to reopen the investigation. Into former Trump campaign officials. Another Democratic senator went to Ukraine and pressured the Ukrainian president not to investigate corruption allegations on involving Joe Biden's son. According to Ukrainian officials, the Democratic National Committee contractor Alexander Alexandra Chalupa tried to get Ukrainian officials to provide dirt on Trump associates and tried to get the former Ukrainian president to comment publicly on alleged ties to Russia. Ukrainian official Sergei Lashenko was a source for Nellie Orr, wife of Department of Justice official Bruce Orr, as she worked on the anti-Trump operation conducted by Fusion GPS and funded by the Democrats. And of course, Democrats on this very committee negotiated with people who they thought were Ukrainians in order to obtain nude pictures of Trump. People can reasonably ask why the Democrats are so determined to impeach this president when in just a year, they'll have a chance. In fact, one Democratic congressman, one of the first to call for Trump's impeachment, gave us the answer when he said, quote, I'm concerned that if we don't impeach the president, he will get reelected, unquote. Winning elections is hard. And when you compete, you have no guarantee you'll win. But the American people do have a say in this and they made their voices heard in the last presidential election. This latest gambit by the Democrats to overturn the people's mandate is unhinged and dangerous. They should end the entire dishonest, grotesque spectacle and get back to work to solving problems, which is what every member of this committee was sent here to do. Judging by today's charade, the chances of that happening anytime soon are zero to none. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, <clears throat> Director, would you rise uh, for the oath and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give today shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. You may be seated. 
The record will reflect that the witness has been duly sworn. <laughs> Director McGuire, would you agree that the whistleblower complaint alleges serious wrongdoing by the President of the United States? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the whistleblower... Well, actually, I apologize, uh, Director. Let me recognize you for your opening statement, um, and you may take as much time as you need. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Schiff, uh, Ranking Member Nunez, and members of the committee, good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking the Chairman and the committee for agreeing to postpone this hearing for one week. This provided sufficient time to allow the executive branch to successfully complete its consultations regarding how to accommodate the committee's request. Mr. Chairman, I've told you this on several occasions, and I would like to say this publicly. I respect you, I respect this committee, and I welcome and take seriously the committee's oversight role. During my confirmation process to be the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, I told the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence that congressional oversight of the intelligence activities is critical and essential to successful operations with the intelligence community. Having served as the director of the National Counterterrorism Center for eight months, and as the acting director of national intelligence for the past six weeks, I continue to believe strongly that the role of congressional oversight. As I pledge to the Senate, I pledge to you today that I will continue to work closely with Congress while I'm serving either in this capacity as acting director of national counterterrorism or when I return to the National Counterterrorism Center to ensure you are fully and currently informed of intelligence activities to facilitate your ability to perform your oversight of the intelligence community. The American people expect us to keep them safe. The intelligence community cannot do that without this committee's support. Before I turn to the matter of hand, there are a few things I would like to say. I am not partisan, and I am not political. I believe in a life of service, and I am honored to be a public servant. I served under eight presidents while I was in uniform. I have taken the oath to the Constitution 11 times. The first time when I was sworn into the United States Navy in 1974, and nine times during my subsequent promotions in the United States Navy. Most recently, former Director Dan Coates administered the oath of office last December when I became the director of the National Counterterrorism Center. I agree with you. The oath is sacred. It's a foundation of our Constitution. The oath to me means not only that I swear true faith and allegiance to that sacred document, but more importantly, I view it as a covenant I have with my workforce that I lead and every American that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of my office. I come from a long line of public servants who have stepped forward even in the most difficult times and austere times to support and defend our country. When I took my uniform off in July of 2010, it was the first time in 70 years that an immediate member of my family was not wearing the cloth of the nation. As a Naval Special Warfare Officer, I had the honor of commanding at every level in the SEAL community. It was at times very demanding, but the rewards of serving in America's Special Operations community more than make up for the demands. After my retirement, I was fortunate to work for a great private sector firm. I left the business world after three years to lead a nonprofit charity. Some question why I would leave a promising business career to run a charity. The answer was quite simple. It was another opportunity to serve. I led a foundation dedicated to honoring the sacrifice of our fallen and severely wounded special operators. The foundation I led enabled hundreds of children of our fallen to attend college. It was extremely meaningful and rewarding. In the winter of 2018, I was asked by former director Dan Coates to return to government service to lead the National Counterterrorism Center. This request was totally unexpected and was not a position I sought. But then again, it was another opportunity to serve my country. In particular, 
I knew that many of the young sailors and junior officers that I had trained 20 years earlier were now senior combat veterans deploying and still sacrificing. I decided if they could continue to serve, returning to government service was the very least I could do. And now, here I am, sitting before you as the acting director of national intelligence. With last month's departure of Dan Coates and Sue Gordon, two exceptional leaders and friends, I was asked to step into their very big shoes and lead the intelligence community until the president nominates and the Senate confirms the next director of national intelligence. I accepted this responsibility because I love this country. I have a deep and profound respect for the men and women of our intelligence community and the mission we execute every day on behalf of the American people. Throughout my career, I have served and led through turbulent times. I have governed every action by the following criteria. It must be legal, it must be moral, and it must be ethical. No one can take an individual's integrity away. It can only be given away. If every action meets those criteria, you will always be a person of integrity. In my nearly four decades of public service, my integrity has never been questioned until now. I'm here today to unequivocally state that as acting DNI, I will continue the same faithful and nonpartisan support in a matter that adheres to the Constitution and the laws of this great country, as long as I serve in this position for whatever period of time that may be. I want to make it clear that I have upheld my responsibility to follow the law every step of the way in the matter that is before us today. I want to also state my support for whistleblower and rights and the laws. Whistleblowing has a long history in our country, dating back to the Continental Congress. This is not surprising, because as a nation, we desire for good government. Therefore, we must protect those who demonstrate courage to report alleged wrongdoing, whether on the battlefield or in the workplace. Indeed, at the start of ethics training the executive branch each year, we are reminded that public service is a public trust. And as public servants, we have a solemn responsibility to do what's right, which includes reporting concerns of waste, fraud, and abuse, and bringing such matters to the attention of Congress under the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act. I applaud all employees who come forward under this act. I am committed to ensuring that all whistleblower complaints are handled appropriately and to protecting the rights of whistleblowers. In this case, the complainant raised a matter with the Intelligence Community Inspector General. The Inspector General is properly protecting the complainant's identity and will not permit the complainant to be subject to any retaliation or adverse consequences for communicating the complaint to the Inspector General. Upholding the integrity of the intelligence community and the workforce is my number one priority. Throughout my career, I relied on the men and women of the intelligence community to do their jobs so I could do mine, and I could personally attest that their efforts saved lives. I would now like to turn to the complaint and provide a general background on how we got to where we are today. On August 26th, the Inspector General forwarded a complaint to me from an employee in the intelligence community. The Inspector General stated that the complaint raised an urgent concern, a legally defined term under Whistleblower Protection Act that has been discussed at length in our letters to the committee on September 16 and 17. Before I turn to the discussion about whether the complaint meets the definition of urgent concern, I first want to talk about an even more fundamental issue. Upon reviewing the complaint, we were immediately struck by the fact that many of the allegations of the complaint are based on a conversation between the President and another foreign leader. Such calls are typically subject to executive privilege. As a result, we consulted with the White House Counsel's Office and we were advised that much of the information in the complaint was, in fact, subject to executive privilege, a privilege that I do not have the authority to waive. Because of that, we were unable to immediately share the details of the complaint with this committee, but continued to consult with the White House counsels in an effort to do so. Yesterday, the President released the transcripts of the call in question, and therefore, we are now able to disclose the details of both complaint and the Inspector General's letter transmitting to us. As a result, I have provided the House and Senate Intelligence Committees with the full, 
unredacted complaint, as well as the Inspector General's letter. Let me also discuss the issue of urgent concern. When transmitting a complaint to me, the Inspector General took the legal position that because the complaint alleges matters of urgent concern, and because he found the allegations to be credible, I was required under the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act to forward the complaint to our oversight committees within seven days of receiving it. As we have previously explained in our letters, urgent concern is a statutorily defined term. To be an urgent concern, the allegations must, in addition to being classified, assert a flagrant, serious problem, abuse, or violation of law, and relate to the funding, administration, or operation of an intelligent activity within the responsibility of the Director of National Intelligence. However, this complaint, conduct, this complaint concerns conduct by someone outside the intelligence community, unrelated to funding, administration, or operation of an intelligence activity under my supervision. Because the allegation on the face did not appear to fall in the statutory framework, my office consulted with the United States Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel and included, we included, the Inspector General in those consultations. After reviewing the complaint and the Inspector General's transmittal letter, the Office of Legal Counsel determined that the complaint's allegations do not meet the statutory requirement, definition, concern, legal, uh, urgent concern, and found that I was not legally required to transmit the material to our oversight committee under the Whistleblower Protection Act. An unclassified version of that Office of Legal Counsel memo was publicly released. As you know, for those of us in the executive branch, Office of Legal Counsel opinions are binding on all of us. In particular, the Office of Legal Counsel opinion states that the President is not a member of the intelligence community, and the communication with the foreign leader involved no intelligence operation or activity aimed at collecting or analyzing foreign intelligence. While this OLC opinion did not require transmission of the complaint to the committees, it did leave me with the discretion to forward the complaint to the committee. However, given the executive privilege issues I discussed, neither the Inspector General nor I were able to share the details of the complaint at the time. When the Inspector General informed me that he still intended to notify the committees of the existence of the complaint, Mr. Chairman, I supported that decision to ensure the committees were kept as informed as possible of this process move forward. I want to raise a few other points about the situation we find ourselves in. First, I want to stress that I believe that the whistleblower and the Inspector General have acted in good faith throughout. I have every reason to believe that they have done everything by the book and followed the law. Respecting the privileged nature of the information and patiently waiting while the executive privilege issues were resolved. Wherever possible, we have worked in partnership with the Inspector General on this matter. While we have differing of opinions on the issue of whether or not it is urgent concern, I strongly believe in the role of the Inspector General. I greatly value the independence he brings to, and his dedication to, and his role in keeping me and the committees informed of matters within the Intelligence Committee. Second, although executive privilege prevented us from sharing the details of the complaint with the committees until recently, this does not mean that the complaint was ignored. The Inspector General, in consultation with my office, referred this matter to the Department of Justice for investigation. Finally, I appreciate that in the past, whistleblower complaints may have been provided to the Congress regardless of whether they were deemed credible or satisfied the urgent, recur urgent concern requirement. However, I am not familiar with any prior instances where a whistleblower complaint touched on such complicated and sensitive issues, including executive privilege. I believe that this matter is unprecedented. I also believe that I handle this matter in full compliance with the law at all times, and I am committed to doing so, sir. I appreciate the committee providing me this opportunity to discuss this matter and the ongoing commitment to work with the Congress on your important oversight role. Thank you very much, sir.
Thank you, Director. <clears throat> Would you agree that the whistleblower complaint alleges serious wrongdoing by the President of the United States? Uh, the whistleblower complaint in, involved uh, the, the allegation of that. Uh, it is not for me and the intelligence community to decide how the president conducts uh, his foreign policy or his interaction with leaders of other countries, sir. Well, I'm not asking you to opine on how the president conducts foreign policy. I'm asking you whether, as the statute requires, this complaint involved serious wrongdoing, in this case, by the President of the United States, an allegation of serious wrongdoing by the President of the United States. Is that not the subject of this complaint? Uh, uh, yes, that is the subject of the allegation of the complaint. And two things, Mr. Chairman. And, and let me ask you yes, about sir. that. The Inspector General found that serious allegation of misconduct by the President credible. Did you also find that credible? I did not criticize the Inspector General's decision on whether or not it was credible. My question was whether or, not, whether or not it meets the urgent concern and the seven day time frame that would follow but once I was notified. My question, so Director. I have, no, I have no, no question in his judgment that he considers it a serious matter. Well, the issue that I don't and, with, and you, would, you would concur, would you not, Director, that this complaint alleging serious wrongdoing by the President was credible? It's not for me to judge, sir. The, what my, it, my is job, for you to, it is for you to judge, apparently. I mean, I, I agree it's not for you to judge. You shall provide it to Congress. But, but indeed, you did judge whether this complaint should be provided to Congress. Can we, can we at least agree that the Inspector General made a sound conclusion that this whistleblower complaint was credible? That is correct. That is uh, in the cover letter that's been provided to uh, the committee. I believe that's uh, also made public, the decision and the recommendation by the Inspector General that, in fact, the allegation was credible. Can we also agree that it was urgent that if the President of the United States was withholding military aid to an ally, even as you received the complaint, and was doing so for a nefarious reason, that is to exercise leverage or the President of Ukraine to dig up manufactured dirt on his opponent. Can we agree that it was urgent while that aid was being withheld? There's two th there are two things. I'm talking about the lay, the common understanding of what urgent means, because urgent. Inspector General said this was urgent, not only in the statutory meaning, this was urgent as everyone understands that term. Can we agree that it was urgent? It was urgent and important, but my job as the Director of National Intelligence was to comply with the Whistleblower Protection Act and that could adhere to the definition of urgent concern, which is a legal term. And to adhere to the meaning of the term shall. Yes, sir. In this case, you sought a second opinion on whether shall really means shall by going to the White House. No, sir. There were two things, as I said in my statement. One, it appeared that it also had matters of executive privilege. I am not authorized as the Director of National Intelligence to waive executive privilege. And at any, time, at any time over the last month that you held this complaint, did the White House assert executive privilege? Mr. Chairman, I have endeavored I, to I think that's a yes or no question. Did they ever assert executive privilege? They were working through the executive privilege pro procedures and deciding whether or not to exert executive privilege. And so it, they, they, they never exerted executive privilege. Is that the answer? The, if, Mr. Chairman, if they did, we would not have released the letters yesterday and all the information that has been forthcoming. Now, the first place you went was to the White House. Is, is, am I to understand that from your opening statement? It wasn't to the Department of Justice. The first place you went for a second opinion was to the White House? I did not go for a second opinion. The question was, is the information contained here subject to executive privilege, not whether or not it meant urgent concern? And, and so the first place you went for advice as to whether you should provide the complaint as the statute requires to Congress was the White House? 
I am not authorized as the Director of National Intelligence to provide executive privileged information. I think it is prudent as a member of the executive branch to check to ensure that in fact it does not. I'm just Unless asking about the sequencing here. Did you first go to the White House the to determine step. whether you should provide a, a complaint to Congress? No, sir, that was not the question. The question was whether or not it, it has executive privilege, not whether or not I should send it on to Congress. Okay. Is the first party you went to outside of your office to seek advice, a counsel, direction, the White House? I have consulted with the White House counsel, and eventually we also consulted with the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel. And my question is, did you go to the White House first? I went to the Office of Legal Counsel for advice. Yes, sir. That, well, I'm asking which you went to first. Did you go to the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel first, or did you go to the White House first? I went to the office, my, excuse me, my team, my office, went to the Office of Legal Counsel first to, to receive whether or not the matter in the letter and in the complaint might meet the executive privilege. They viewed it and said, we've determined that it appears to be executive privilege. And until executive privilege is determined and cleared, I did not have the authority to be able to send that forward to the committee. I worked with the Office of Legal Counsel for the past several weeks to get resolution on this. It's a very deliberate process. Well, Director, I'm just, I'm still trying to understand the chronology. So you first went to the Office of Legal Counsel and then you went to White House Counsel? We went, excuse me, and then to the, repeat that please, sir. I'm just trying to understand the chronology. You first went to the Office of Legal Counsel and then you went to the White House Counsel? No, 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 sir, no, sir, no. We went okay. to the, we went to the White House first to determine, to ask the okay, question. Okay, that, that's all I wanted to know was chronology. So you went to the White House first. So you went to the subject of the complaint for advice first about whether you should provide the complaint to Congress. There were issues within this, a couple of things. One, it did appear that it has executive privilege. If it does have executive privilege, it is the White House that determines that. I cannot determine that as the Director of National Intelligence. But in this case, the, the White House, the President, is the subject of the complaint. He's the subject of the wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Were you aware when you went to the White House for advice about whether evidence of wrongdoing by the White House should be provided to the Congress, were you aware that the White House counsel has taken the unprecedented position that the privilege applies to communications involving the President? Um, when he was president, involving the president when he wasn't president, involving people who never served in the administration, involving people who never served in the administration even when they're not even talking to the president. Were you aware that that is the, the unprecedented position of the White House, the White House you went to for advice about whether you should turn over a complaint involving the White House? Mr. Chairman, as I said in my opening statement, I believe that everything here in this matter is totally unprecedented, and that is why my former directors of national intelligence forwarded them to you whether or not it met urgent concern or whether it was serious. This was different. And to me, it just seemed prudent to be able to check and ensure as a member of the executive branch before I sent it forward. I just have a couple more questions. I'm going to turn over the ranking member and he may consume as much time as I did. Um, the second place you went to was the Justice Department. <clears throat> and you went to that department headed by a man, Bill Barr, who was also implicated in the complaint. And you knew that when you went to the Department of Justice for an opinion, correct? That Bill Barr was mentioned in the complaint? Mr. Chairman, I went to the Office of Legal Counsel in consultation with the ICIG. He was a part of that to receive whether or not this met the criteria. Yes, but that ICIG vehemently disagreed with the opinion of the Bill Barr Justice Department, did he not? He still met, considered it a matter of urgent concern. However, as you know, opinions from Department of Justice, Office of Legal Counsel, are binding on all of us in the executive branch. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think it's appropriate that you go to a department run by someone who's the subject of the complaint to get advice 
or who is a subject of the complaint or implicated in the complaint for advice as to whether you should provide that complaint to Congress? Did, did, did that, that conflict of interest concern you? Mr. Chairman, when I saw this report and complaint, immediately I knew that this was a serious matter. It came to me, and I just thought it would be prudent well, to I, ensure. I, I'm just that, asking if the conflict of interest concerned you. No, that sir. Well, sir, I have to work with what I've got, and that is the Office of Legal Counsel within the executive branch. Well, what, I had what, no what other you also had was a statute that says shall, and even then you said you had the discretion to provide it, but, but did not. Because it did not meet the matter of urgent concern that took away the seven-day timeline, I have endeavored to work with the Office of Legal Counsel in order to get the material to you, which we, you have provided to you uh, yesterday. Now, I have to tell you, Chairman, it is not perhaps at the timeline that I would have desired, or you, but the Office of Legal Counsel has to make sure they make prudent decisions, and yesterday, when the President released the transcripts of his call with the President of the Ukraine, then they could no longer, it no, executive privilege no longer applied, and that is when I was free to be able to send the complaint to the committee. Director, you don't believe the whistleblower is a political hack, do you? I don't know who the whistleblower is, Mr. Chairman. To be honest with you, I've done my utmost to make sure that I protect his anonymity. That doesn't sound like much of a defense of the whistleblower here, someone you found did everything right. You don't believe the whistleblower is a political hack, do you, Director? I believe that, as I said before, Mr. Chairman, I believe the whistleblower are, is are operating in good faith. Well, then, they couldn't, be, the then law. They, they couldn't be in good faith if they were acting as a political hack, could they? Mr. Chairman, my job is to support and lead the entire intelligence community. That individual works for me. Therefore, it is my job to make sure that I support and defend that person. You don't have any reason to accuse them of disloyalty to our country or suggest they're beholden to some other country, do Absol you? Sir, absolutely not. I believe that the whistleblower followed the steps every step of the way. However, the statute was one in this situation involving the President of the United States, who is not in the intelligence community, or matters underneath my supervision, did not meet the criteria for urgent concern. Well, I'm just asking about the whistleblower right now. I think the whistleblower did the right thing. I think he followed the law every step of the way, and we just got stuck Th with Then, then why, Director, when the President called the whistleblower a political hack and suggested that he or she might be disloyal to the country, why did you remain silent? I did not remain silent, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. I issued a statement to my workforce telling and committing my commitment to the whistleblower protection and ensuring that I would provide protection to anybody within the intelligence community who comes forward. But the way this thing was blowing out, I didn't think it was appropriate for me to be making a press statement so that we counter each other every step I, of the way. I, I think it was not only appropriate, but there's nothing that would have given more confidence to the workforce than to hearing you publicly say, no one should be calling this professional who did the right thing a hack or a traitor or anything else. Um, I think that would have meant a great deal of the workforce. So, Mr. Nunes, you're recognized. Welcome, uh, Mr. Director. It's a pleasure to, to have you here. And uh, you're going to be part of a charade of legal word games. They're going to try to get you to say something that can be repeated by the media that is here that wants to report this story. You, I just want to get one thing straight, because one of the quotes they're going to use from you is you saying that this was a credible uh, complaint. That will be used and spun as you're saying that it was true. And I want to give you an opportunity to, you, you do not, you have not investigated the veracity or the truthfulness of this complaint. Uh, that's correct, Ranking Member. The determination on credible was made by the IC Inspector General. He made the determination that it is credible, and he also made the determination of urgent concern. My uh, question was not, I did not question his judgment there. The question I had was, does in fact this allegation of wrongdoing meet the criteria, the statutory criteria of urgent concern? And the other issue, as I said, complicated things, did it in fact, the allegations within this whistleblower uh, complaint involve executive privilege? 
thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, have you ever, uh, you mentioned it a little bit in your testimony, but have you ever or are you aware of any former DNIs who have testified uh, about whistleblower complaints in the public? Not to my knowledge, uh, Ranking Member. I, I do not know. Are you aware of any cases like this that were put into the spotlight? Is, would this be the way to handle it out in the public like this? I am not aware of any, but I want to say once again, I believe that the situation we have and why we're here this morning is because this case is unique and unprecedented. So why are cases normally not handled out in the public? All the other uh, cases that came before either this committee or the Senate committee, whether or not they met the criteria of urgent concern were forwarded because they involved members of the intelligence community who were in fact in organizations underneath the DNI's authority and responsibility. This one just did not come that way because it involved a member, an individual who is not a member of the intelligence community or an organization underneath the authority of the DNI. So this one is different from all others in the past that I am aware of. So I wanna get into how this all uh, got out in the public over the last, this has basically been an orchestrated effort over, over two weeks. Um, if you, we were first told about it, um, I don't know, a week and a half ago, uh, and we were told very specifically that the whistleblower did not want to get any of this information out. They didn't want it to leak out. So there were only a few potential groups of people that would have known about this complaint. You and your, your people within your office. Yes, sir. The people within the inspector general's office and the whistleblower and whoever that whistleblower gave this information to. So what I'm trying to, to ascertain is how would it run in all the mainstream media outlets? How did they get, even though they got a lot of it wrong, but they had the basics of it that it involved the, the President of the United States talking to a foreign leader. So did anybody, you or anybody in your office leak this to the Washington Post or NBC News? Ranking member, I lead the intelligence community. We know how to keep a secret. Uh, as far as how that got into the press, I really do not know, sir. I just know that it's all over the place, and as you said, it's been reported by different uh, uh, media for the past several weeks. Where they get their information from, I don't know. So but that, was, you know. But it was, not, it was not from the intelligence community, from me, or from my office. Thank you, uh, Director. So this is not the first time this has happened to pr this president that happened with a call between the Mexican president, the Australian prime minister. So it's happened twice before that, that pieces of transcripts leaked out. Uh, and of course, this time it was leaked out again uh, and the president, uh, thankfully he was able to put this out because of the, uh, because of the actions uh, of this, uh, of the situation, as you said, is that's unprecedented. Is it normal for the President of the United States to have their conversations leak out? I mean, this is a third time. Uh, I would have to leave that to the White House to, uh, to respond to that, their ranking member. But uh, to me, uh, well, the uh, President of the United States conversation with any other head of state, I would consider privileged conversation. But clearly, I mean, those conversations are being captured by the intelligence agencies. So, no, not necessarily, sir. I mean, the, if 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 the president of the well, I should say this: they're they're captured and then disseminated. When they're they, captured and disseminated to the in, intelligence agencies. I have to be careful in this open hearing about you know how I respond to that. The intelligence community and the national security agency, obviously, you know, they collect things that are to protect. I, I just want to make sure because I'm just. I mean, are we just going to foreign leaders? We're not just have either the President of the United States not talk to foreign leaders, or we should just, or publish, just publish all the transcripts, because that's what's happening here. Ranking member. So, and somebody's leaking this, and it's likely coming from, from the agencies that you oversee. 
uh, uh, ranking member, no, that, that's, sir. I mean, I'm not saying that you, you don't know, but we had the, the transcript with the Mexican president, the Australian prime minister, and now contents of a call with the Ukrainian president leak out. Ranking member, the allegation in the whistleblower complaint was that there were about 12 people who listened in on the conversation, members of the National Security Council and others. And then others were briefed from State Department as well of the transcripts because they have an area responsibility and a region responsibility, then they would be informed on the interaction. So there were a number of people that from the White House briefed from the call, this would not be something that- Well, I'm quite, I'm quite sure of this. The yes, White House probably didn't leak this out. I wouldn't say the White House, but there are individuals within the White House that may or may not, I don't know. But it would not be from an intelligence intercept, I will say that. Right, I'm not, I'm just saying the dissemination, the dissemination of these calls is supposed to be sacred, right? I mean, it's, and it is important for yes, the State Department and the appropriate agencies to get, I'm not saying it's all in the intelligence agency, but when a president talks to a foreign leader, it's, it's confidential, those contents are confidential, there could be some facts of that conversation that you do want to get to the appropriate agency, not just the, not just the IC, I wanna be clear about that, but, but this is now the third time. I'm not aware of this ever happening before, of, of contents of calls like this getting out. I, I, I really don't know, uh, Ranking Member, I'm not aware. I, I don't have the, uh, the numbers to, th it just seems to me though that it is unprecedented, and I would also say, I think that the decision by the President yesterday to release the transcripts of his conversation with the President of the Ukraine is probably unprecedented as well. Well, we appreciate you uh, being here and uh, have fun. Uh, be careful what you say, because they're going to use these words uh, against you. Well, I tell you what, <laughs> ranking member, either way, I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored to be leading the well, And I appreciate your service uh, to this country for a long time, and I'm sure we'll be talking again soon, hopefully not in the public, hopefully uh, behind closed doors like this is supposed to be done. Thank you very much, Ranking. I yield back. Mr. Himes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director McGuire, thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for your profound service and the service of your family to this country. Um, Director, what I find bewildering about this whole conversation is that we are not sitting here today, and the American public is not aware of the allegations of the president asking for a favor of uh, investigation into his political opponent. We're not aware of the murky decision to withhold aid. We're not aware of Mr. Giuliani's apparent establishment of a personal State Department. We are not aware of a possible re retaliation against a U.S. ambassador. None of this happens but for the decision of your Inspector General, Michael Atkinson, a man who was appointed by President Trump and confirmed by a Republican Senate, to come to this committee seven days after the complaint was required by law to be transmitted to us. It was his decision personal decision, not the kaleidoscope of fantabulistic conspiracy theories the ranking member thinks is happening here, but it was the decision of Michael Atkinson, an appointee of this president, to come to this committee following not advice from you or any law, but following his own conscience. Without his decision to do this, none of this is happening, correct? I applaud Michael. I, I applaud Michael uh, uh, the, the way he has done this. He has acted in good faith. He has followed the law every step of the way. The question is, Congressman, does it, did it, or did it not meet the legal definition? No, no, no sir, I asked a very different question, which was without his decision, it, 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 it's a simple question, without his decision, none of this is happening. Is that correct? Well, we got to back up to the whistleblower as well, so. Okay, and I should have noted that the whistleblower also deserves the same accolades that, that Mr. Atkinson does. Uh, Director, were you ever advised by the White House not to provide this complaint to Congress for any reason? No, Congressman. Okay. And as I understand it, the opinion uh, was that you were not obligated to convey, despite the very clear wording of the law, to convey the complaint to Congress. So the decision was taken to defy a subpoena of this Congress, the subpoena of, Sever of September 17th, to turn over the complaint. Who made the decision to defy that subpoena of September 17th? Congressman, 
urgent concern. Sir, I'm asking a very simple oh. question. Who made the decision to defy the congressional subpoena? Somebody said we will not abide by the subpoena, and I'd like to know who that somebody was. Uh, Congressman, nobody did. I endeavored, once we no longer had urgent concern with the seven-day timeline, you know, to work to get the information to the committee. What I needed to do was to get work through the executive privilege hurdles with the Office of Legal Counsel at the White House. Uh, although this was the most important issue to me, you know, the White House has got quite a few other issues that they were dealt with. You know, I would have liked to have had, as I said to the chairman, that perhaps this moved a little faster than it did, but this is a very deliberate process, and finally, you know, it came to a head yesterday. So, with, you know, when I received the information on the 26th of August, we had seven days based on the Whistleblower Protection Act. All we did was lose those seven days. It may have taken longer than we would have liked, or you would have liked, but you have the information. So, so again, sir, just so, I, so I'm focused on the subpoena. Yes, sir. The subpoena's on your desk. It's a subpoena of the Congress of the United States. It's pretty clear in what it asked for. You're saying that a decision was never taken not to comply with that subpoena, and yet somehow it wasn't complied with. I'm, I'm, I'm again, I'm looking for the decision-making well, process to ignore a legal congressional subpoena. Congressman, I did not ignore. I dealt with the chairman of this committee and asked to have one more week to be able to do what I needed to do to get this information released. He was gracious enough, and this committee was also very supportive. It wasn't something that it was ready to go, but I was committed, fully committed to this committee and to the chairman to get that information, and I finally was able to provide that yesterday. But, um, okay, thank you, Director. Um, Director, did you or your office ever speak to the President of the United States about this complaint? Um, Congressman, I'm, I'm the President's intelligence officer. I speak with him several times throughout the week. Okay. Sir, let me repeat my question. Did you ever speak to the President about this complaint? My conversations with the President, because I'm the Director of National Intelligence, are privileged. And it would be inappropriate for me because it would destroy my relationship with the President in intelligence matters to divulge any of my conversations with the President of the United States. But just so we can be clear for the record, you are not denying that you spoke to the President about this complaint? What I'm saying, Congressman, is that I will not divulge privileged conversations that I have as the Director of National Intelligence with the President. Has the White House instructed you to assert that privilege? No, sir. Okay. That's, just, that's just a member of the Executive Committee, I mean Executive Branch, as a member of the National Security Council, and also member of the Homeland Committee. And um, that's, you know, I just have to maintain the discretion and protect the conversation with the President of the United States. Th thank yes, you, sir. Director. I appreciate that answer. Apparently the clock is broken, but I will yield back the balance of my thank time. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Conaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral, thank you for being here. Uh, you and I are at a competitive disadvantage because neither one of us are lawyers, and uh, that may be a badge of honor for some of us. Um, you have lawyers on your staff, sir? I do, Congressman. All right, and uh, your lawyers have looked at this uh, urgent concern definition thoroughly and have given you advice? Yes, Congressman. Uh, if the black letter law was so clear in black letter, how is it that we've got different attorneys giving us, you and, the, you and I, different opinions? Uh, that's a rhetorical question that, uh, that, that with respect to this issue. Um, just to clarify, uh, Mike Atkinson was in our group and in front of us last week, did a very good job of, of telling us what he did, what he didn't do. We now know for sure what it is that he was able to do. As part of his investigation, uh, he did not request records of the call from the president and uh, the reason he did is he cited the difficulty of working through all of that would have probably meant that he couldn't comply with the 14 day time frame. So even he did not try to uh, uh, overrun the White House's executive privilege over the conversation that the president had with uh, President Zelensky. Um, he also said um, in his letter, I also determined, this is quoting Michael, I also determined that there were reasonable grounds to believe that information relating to the urgent concern appeared credible. Now, that's a different statement than a flat out, it's credible. So just again, a rhetorical statement. Is there anything in statute from your, your lawyers in advising you that says that the determination of urgent concern lies solely with the ICIG? No, sir, I was never advised by my uh, legal counsel to, to that effect. All right, has the, uh, to your knowledge, has the Justice Department ever weighed in 
uh, to say that the fact that DNI can't make a separate decision with respect to that seven-day process, that the matter is not of urgent concern, as, you've, uh, as your team decided? The matter of urgent concern is a legally defining term. It's pretty much either yes or no. Well, it, apparently that's not the case, Admiral, because uh, IG said it was, and, and, it, and you're saying it's not under that legal definition because it involved the president. He says, I, last time I checked, you're pretty familiar with chains of command, I know. He's not in, uh, you're not, uh, he's not in your chain of command. You're in his chain of command. And so, th for very definite reasons, appear to be credible, it doesn't meet the statutorily urgent concern definition with respect to the whistleblower protections of, of the IG. Uh, and, and your team made that, made, that, made that call. The Inspector General made a different call. Uh, no, 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 sir. Uh, my I, team did said, not John, make the decision. Uh, Ratcliffe? It, John, was, Ratcliffe. it was the Chief. Department of Justice to... Office of Legal Counsel that made the determination that it was not urgent concern. All we wanted to do was just check and see. And to me, uh, it just seemed prudent with the matter at hand right now to be able to just make sure that in fact it did. And when it didn't, I want to say once again, I endeavored to get that information to this committee. Okay, sir, just to clarify the role that, uh, that uh, uh, the Inspector General had with respect to the Department of Justice. I heard you say that he was involved in the conversations allowed to make his case, but also said you gave him the letter, gave the Justice Department the letter. What, what, was, what was his exact involvement in making his case to the uh, Justice Department to uh, his decision? Was he actually there present physically or his lawyers there? What was, what the, was the To the best of my knowledge, the uh, ICIG's transmittal letter as well as the complaint from the whistleblower were forwarded to the uh, Office of Legal Counsel for their determination. I believe that that is what they based their opinion on. Okay, so you don't think he had a if personal... I, if, I'm, if I'm incorrect, I will come back to the committee and correct that, sir. Okay, appreciate that. Um, you know, tough spot. I uh, appreciate your long uh, storied history. Um, I apologize if your integrity was insulted. Uh, that happens in this arena a lot, uh, sometimes justified and most of the time not in yours insult your integrity was not uh, justified in interest. The fact that we have differences of opinion, uh, when we're, we start losing those differences of opinion, we start to attack each other, call each other names and those kinds of things. And so uh, my experience is, is uh, when you've got a legal matter, I've got lawyers I've got, I pay, you've got lawyers you pay, I typically stick with the lawyers that I'm paying. And so you had good legal advice on this issue in a really tough spot, wanting to make sure that this whistleblower was protected, but at the same time that if, in fact, there was something awry here, that uh, it would uh, it would be it'd get the full airing that it's, uh, it's clearly getting. So thank you for your service, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman. Ms. Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Director McGuire, thanks so much for being here. I want to turn to what I fear may be one of the most damaging long-term effects of this whistleblower episode, and that is the chilling effect that it will have on others in government who may witness misconduct, but now may be afraid to come forward to report it. Sir, I'm worried that government employees and contractors may see how important this situation has played out and decide it's not worth putting themselves on the line. The fact that a whistleblower followed all of the proper procedures to report misconduct, and then the Department of Justice and the White House seems to have weighed in to keep the complaint hidden is problematic, sir. I wanna know whether or not you see how problematic this will be and having a chilling effect on on members of the IC that you are sworn to represent and ostensibly protect? Congresswoman, I think that's a fair assessment. I don't uh, disagree with what you've said. I have endeavored to uh, transmit to uh, the intelligence community my support the whistleblowers, and I'm quite sure that for at least two hours this morning, there, there are not many people in the intelligence community who are doing anything that's productive besides watching this. Right, and so my concern, I think, is a valid one, that in fact, what has happened with this whistleblower episode will have a chilling effect. I just also wanna ask you, um, have you given direction to this whistleblower that he can, in fact, or he or she, can, in fact, come before Congress? 
Director, when the president called the whistleblower a political hack and suggested that he or she was potentially disloyal to the country, you remained silent. I'm not sure why, but I also think that that adds to the chilling effect. The uh, statute seems pretty clear that uh, you shall, everybody has a role to play. The process seems pretty clear. And part of it also includes you directing the whistleblower of his or her protected rights. Can you confirm that you've directed that whistleblower that he or she can come before Congress? Well, Congresswoman, there, there are several questions there. Uh, one, I do not know the identity of the whistleblower. Two, now that the complaint has come forward, we are working with his counsel in order to be able to provide them with security clearance. So, sir, I think it's pretty, uh, my, my question is pretty simple. Uh, can you assure this committee and the American public that the whistleblower is authorized to speak to the committee with the full protections of the Whistleblower Act? Can you confirm that? That's a yes or no question. Right now, I'm working through that with the chair. And to the best of my ability, I believe the chair is uh, was asking to have the whistleblower come forward. And I'm working with counsel, with the committee, to support that. Can request. you assure the American public that the end result will be that the whistleblower will be able to come before this committee and Congress and have the full protections of the whistleblower? After all, what is the whistleblower uh, a statute for, if not to provide those full protections against retaliation, against litigation? Congresswoman, I am doing everything to endeavor to support that. Will the gentlewoman yield? Yes. Um, Director, I have, do I have your assurance that once you work out the security clearances for the whistleblower's counsel, that that whistleblower will be able to relate the full facts within his knowledge that concern wrongdoing by the president or anyone else, that he or she will not be inhibited in what they can tell our committee, that there will not be some minder from the White House or elsewhere um, sitting next to them telling them what they can answer or not answer, do I have your assurance that the whistleblower will be able to testify fully and freely um, and enjoy the protections of the law. Yes, Congressman. Thank you. I yield back to the gentleman. So, Mr. Director, I also want to understand what you're going to do to try to ensure the trust of the employees and contractors that you represent to assure the American people that the whistleblower statute is, in fact, uh, being properly um, uh, adhered to and that no further efforts would be to obstruct an opportunity for a whistleblower who has watched misconduct to actually get justice. Congresswoman, uh, supporting and leading the member and women of the intelligence community are my highest priority. I don't consider that they work for me. As the director of national intelligence, I believe that I well, serve. Well, sir, I just want to say and go on record as yes, being very clear that this will have a chilling effect. And I, that is exactly not what the statute was intended for. It was intended for transparency. It was, pretended, it was intended in also to give the whistleblower certain protections. And I think the American people deserve that. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Turner. Director, thank you for being here. Good morning, um, Congressman. Thank you for your, your service and the, the clarity at which you have described the deliberations that you went through and applying the laws with respect to this complaint um, it is incredibly admirable in the manner in which you've approached this. Now, I've read the complaint, and I've read the transcript of the conversation with the president and the president of Ukraine. Concerning that conversation, I want to say uh, to the president, um, this is not okay. It isn't, that, that conversation is not okay, and I think it's disappointing to the American public when they read the transcript. I can say what else it is not. It is not what's in the complaint. We now have the complaint and the transcript, and people can read that the allegations of the complaint in the complaint are not the allegations of the subject matter of this conversation. What else it's not? It's not the conversation that was in the chairman's opening statement. And while the chairman was speaking, I actually had someone text me, is he just making this up? And, and yes, yes, he, he was. Because sometimes fiction is better than the actual words or the text. But luckily, the American public are smart and they have the transcript. They've read the conversation. They know when someone's just making it up. Now, we've seen this movie before. We've been here all year on litigating impeachment, well, long before the July 25th 
conversation happened between the president and the president of U Ukraine. And we've heard the clicks of the cameras in this intelligence committee's room where we've not been focusing on the issues of the national security threats, but instead of the calls and for impeachment, which is really an assault on the electorate, not just this president. Now, the complaint we now have, Mr. Director, is based on hearsay. Uh, the person who wrote it says, I talked to people and they told me these things. Now, the American public has the transcript and the complaint, so they have the ability to compare them. What's clear about the complaint is it's based on political uh, issues, uh, Mr. Director. He's alleging, or she is alleging, that the actions of the president were political in nature. Now, that's my concern about how this is applied to the whistleblower statute. The whistleblower statute is intended to better provide those in the intelligence community an opportunity to come to Congress when they're concerned about abuses of powers and laws, but it's about the intelligence community. It's about abuse of surveillance, about the um, abuse of the, the spy mechanisms that we have. It, this is about the, actually the product of surveillance. Somebody has been had access to surveillance that related the president's conversations and has brought us forward to us. I'd like for you to, to, um, to turn for a moment and, and tell us your thoughts of the whistleblower process and the, the, the concerns as to why it has to be there so that the, the intelligence community can be held accountable and we can have oversight. Because it certainly wasn't there to, for oversight of the president. It was there for oversight for the intelligence community. So if you could describe your thoughts on that. And then I was very interested in your discussion but on the issue of executive privilege because the, there's been much made of the fact that the law says on the whistleblower statute that you shall. Uh, clearly you have a conflict of laws when you have both the executive privilege issue and the issue of the word shall. So first, could you tell us the importance of the whistleblower statute with respect to accountability of the intelligence community? Um, and our role of oversight there, and then your, um, your process, your um, uh, effects of being stuck in the middle where you have these conflicts of laws, Mr. Director. Uh, Congressman, the um, Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act is to apply to the intelligence community. And then at, it pertains to financial, administrative, or operational activities within the intelligence community in the, under the oversight and responsibility of the Director of National Intelligence. It does not allow a member of the intelligence community to report any wrongdoing that comes from anywhere in the federal government. The written, uh, and, and so with that, I do believe that that is about the Intelligence uh, Whistleblower Protection Act was the best vehicle that the whistleblower had to use. And it came to me and discussion with our, uh, our ICIG, who is a colleague? And uh, the determination was made, you know, by the, um, well, that, uh, that he viewed that it was in fact credible and that it was a matter of urgent concern. And I just thought it would be prudent to have another opinion. I have worked with lawyers my whole career, whether it was the rule of armed conflict, admiralty claims, uh, or rules of engagement, or just the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And I have found that different lawyers have different opinions on the same subject. We have nine justices of the Supreme Court. More often than not, the opinions are 5-4. That doesn't mean that five are right and four are wrong. There are differences of opinion. But when this matter came to me, I have a lot of life experience. I realized the importance of the matter that is before us this morning. And I thought that it would be prudent for me to ensure that, in fact, it met that statute before I sent it forward in compliance with the Whistleblower Protection Act. And I hope that responds to your question, sir. I yield back. As an aside, I want to mention that uh, my colleague is right on both counts. Um, it's not okay, uh, but also my summary of the President's call was meant to be at least part in parity. The fact that that's not clear is a separate problem uh, in and of itself. Uh, of course, the President never said, um, if, I, uh, if you don't understand me, I'm going to say it seven more times. My point is, that's the message that the Ukraine President was receiving. 
in not so many words. Um, Mr. Carson. Thank you, Chairman Schiff. Um, thank you, Director McGuire, for your service. Uh, Director McGuire, this appears uh, to be the first intelligence community whistleblower complaint that has ever, ever uh, been withheld from Congress. Is that right, sir? Uh, uh, Congressman Carson, I, I believe that uh, it, it might be. And once again, I said in my statement, it is, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, unprecedented. It is unprecedented, sir. I, 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 do you know why it's unprecedented? I think it's because the law that Congress, that this very committee uh, drafted, really couldn't be clearer. It states that upon receiving such an urgent complaint from the Inspector General, you, the Director of National Intelligence, quote, shall, end quote, forward it to the Intel Committees within seven days, no ifs, ands, or buts. And even when the IG has found complaints not to be an urgent concern or even credible, your office has consistently and uniformly still transmitted those complaints to the Intelligence Committees. Is that right, sir? Congressman Carson, in the past, even if they were not a matter of urgent concern or whether they were not credible, they were forwarded. But in each and every instance prior to this, it involved members of the intelligence community who were serving in organizations <laughs> underneath the, the control of the DNI. This one is different because it did not meet those two criteria. Yes. Director, uh, does executive privilege, sir, in your mind, or, or laws that regulate the intelligence community preempt or negate even the laws that safeguard the security of America's democratic elections and her democracy itself, sir? No, Chairman uh, Carson, it does not. Um, yeah, not, 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 notwithstanding, Director, this unambiguous mandate and the consistent practice of your office that you withheld this urgent complaint from Congress at the direction of the White House and the Justice Department. Uh, you followed their orders instead of the law. And if the Inspector General had not brought this complaint to our attention, uh, you and the Trump administration might have gotten away with this unprecedented action. Sir, you released a statement yesterday affirming your oath to the Constitution and your dedication to the rule of law. But I'm having trouble understanding how that statement uh, can be true in light of the facts here. Uh, can you explain that to us, sir? Uh, Congressman Carson, a couple of things. The White House did not, did not direct me to withhold the information. Neither did the Office of Legal Counsel. That uh, opinion has been unclassified and has been disseminated. The question came down to urgent concern, which is a legal definition. It doesn't mean, is it important? Is it timely? Urgent concern met the certain criteria that we've discussed several times here. So it did not. And all that did, sir, was then just take away the seven days. Now, as I said before, just because it was not forwarded to this committee does not mean that it went unanswered. The ICIG and the Justice Department referred it to the Federal Bureau of Investigation for investigation. So this is not the, and that was working, while I was endeavoring to get the um, executive privilege concerns addressed so that it can then be forwarded. It was not stonewalling. I didn't receive direction from anybody. I was just trying to work through the process and the law the way it is written. I have to comply with the way the law is, not the way some people would like it to be. And if I could do otherwise, it would have been much more convenient for me, uh, Congressman. Uh, and, and lastly, Director, uh, as you sit here today, sir, do you commit to providing every single whistleblower complaint intended for Congress to the Intelligence Committees as required by the statute, sir? If it's required by the statute, Congressman Carson, yes, I will. That's good to know, sir, and, and I certainly hope so because I think the unprecedented decision uh, to withhold this whistleblower complaint from Congress, I think it raises concerns, very serious concerns for us and for me. Um, and I think that we need to get to the bottom of this. I yield the balance of my time, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Carson. Thank you. Um, how much time does the gentleman have remaining? 20 seconds. OK, well, um, Director, you were not directed to withhold the complaint. Is that your testimony? Yes, that, that is absolutely true. Uh, so you exercised your discretion 
to withhold the complaint from the committee? I did not, sir. What I did was I delayed it because it did not meet the statutorily definition of urgent concern, and I was working through and, the- And Director, you're aware, you spent a lot of time focusing on the definition of urgent concern. You're aware that the practice of your office has been that regardless of whether the complaint meets the definition of urgent concern, regardless of whether Inspector General founds it credible or incredible, the complaint is always given to our committee. You're aware that's the unbroken practice since the establishment of your office and the Inspector General. Are, are you aware of that? Chairman, every previous whistleblower complaint that was forwarded to the intelligence committees involved a member of the intelligence community and an organization under which the Director of National Intelligence had authority and responsibility. And, and, but you're aware that the, the past practice has been, we're talking about urgent concern here, that whether you or the Inspector General or everybody else believes it meets the statutory definition, the past practice has always been to give it to this committee. You're, you're aware of that, right? I am aware that this is unprecedented, okay. and this has uh, never and, happened. And, and with that, sir, I and, agree. This has never happened before, but then again, this is a unique situation. But, but you, Director, made the decision. You I, made the decision to withhold it from the committee for a month when the White House had made no claim of executive privilege, when the Department of Justice said, you don't have to give it to them, but you can, you made the decision not to. No, that's not true, sir. What the uh, Office of Legal Counsel said, that it does not meet the legal definition of urgent concern. So it said it, you're not required. It didn't say you cannot provide it, it said you're not required to. That is, if you don't want to, we're not gonna force you, you're not required, but it didn't say you can't. Am I right? What it, what it, it allowed me, and I t said that in my opening statement, but even so, it was referred to the FBI for investigation, and I was endeavoring to get the information to you, Mr. Chairman, but I could not forward it as a member of the executive branch without executive privileges being addressed. And, and I feel that the White House counsel was doing the best that they could in order to get that, and it took longer than I would have liked, that's for sure, but that came to a uh, 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 conclusion yesterday with the release of the uh, transcripts. And because the transcripts were released, then no longer was there a situation of executive privilege. And I was then free to send both the Inspector General's cover letter and the complaint to you. Dr. But there's no time was there any intent on my part, sir, ever to withhold the information from you as the chair, this committee, or the Senate Intelligence well, Committee? I, Director, I wish I had the confidence of knowing that but for this hearing, but for the deadline that we were forced to set with this hearing, that we would have been provided that complaint. But I don't know that we would have ever seen that complaint. Um, Dr. Wenstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you, Mr. McGuire, for being here today. You know, I think it's a shame that we started off this hearing with uh, fictional remarks, the implication of a conversation that took place between a president and a foreign leader, putting words into it that did not exist, they're not in the transcript. And I will contend that those were intentionally not clear, and the chairman described it as parody, and I don't believe that this is the time or the place for parody when we are trying to seek facts nor do those that were involved with the conversation agree with the parody that the chairman gave us. And unfortunately today, many innocent Americans are gonna turn on their TV and the media is only gonna show that section of what the chairman had to say. But I'm also glad to know that many Americans have seen this movie too many times and they're tired of it. But let me get to some questions, sir, if I can. Let's go to the word credible. Credible does not mean proven true or factual, would that be correct in this situation? I find no fault in your logic, Congressman. Okay, so you know the interpretation, it was credible, but also was that decision made by the IG before seeing the transcript of the conversation? I believe that the IC IG conducted to his, uh, best of his ability, uh, the investigation, and he found to his ability that uh, based on the evidence and discussing it with the whistleblower, that he thought that in fact it was credible. But the IG didn't necessarily have the transcript of the conversation. He did not, no he okay. did not. Okay, that, that's, that's my question. So to another point, 
You know, one of the issues that arose out of the Russia investigation last Congress was a question over the latitude provided to the U.S. President to conduct foreign affairs. In 2017, I asked then CIA Director Brennan how he viewed statements made by President Obama to Russian President Medvedev regarding having more flexibility to negotiate after his 2012 election. And President Medvedev replied that he would transmit the information to Vladimir and that Medvedev stood with President Obama. That was in an open hearing. Director Brennan wouldn't entertain my question and insisted on not answering due to the fact that the conversation was between the heads of government. That's what he said. He further claimed he was avoiding getting involved in political partisan issues. Which brings me to a similar question related to this whistleblower complaint. One, you said this executive privilege is unwaverable, and, and I, I think that's kind of consistent with CIA Director Brennan was implying. Uh, Congressman, only uh, the White House and the President can uh, waive executive privilege. The President exerts executive privilege, and only the White House and the President can waive that. So, uh, Director Brennan gave me the impression then that that was like, that's the rule, that's the law, so I'm going to have to go with that. But do you believe the President's entitled to withhold his or her communications from Congress if the conversation is used in a whistleblower case? I think that uh, the president, when he uh, conducts uh, diplomacy and deals with foreign heads of state, he has every right to be able to have that information uh, be held within uh, the White House and uh, the executive branch. And uh, if, if yesterday, I think the uh, uh, transmission of the call is unprecedented. And it's also, I think that um, uh, other future leaders, when they interact with our head of state, might be more cautious in what they say and reduce the interaction that they have with the president because of that release. So we may need to change our process here because uh, I guess if a decision regarding executive privilege, um, maybe it should be made prior to submitting the communication to Congress. Well, either that, I believe that this committee wrote the law and based on what we're doing today, you know, perhaps it needs to be relooked. I don't know. I leave that to the uh, legislative branch. So also, uh, we may need to change process. You know, the 14 days, that might be kind of tough to adhere to. So I, I think maybe, uh, you know, this is a special circumstance, unprecedented. Maybe there should be some leeway in the time frame instead of the narrow 14 days. And I, and I don't know if you know, was, did, you, did you feel or did the IG ever say that they felt rushed to making a decision because of the 14-day process? No, Congressman, uh, I believe that he's a very experienced uh, Inspector General. He's used to dealing with the 14-day process, and uh, when you work under a timeline like that, he worked with his staff, and I think endeavored to, to the extent because he was following the statute as he believed uh, it was written. So uh, I would think that any prudent lawyer would like to have more time to be able to collect the facts and do other things, but uh, uh, Michael Atkinson was under the 14-day timeline, and he did the best of his ability to comply with that. Did you feel rushed in any way, sir? I did not. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Director McGuire, for your extraordinarily long service um, to our country. At any point during this process, did you personally threaten to resign if the complaint was not provided to the committee? No, Congressman, I, I, I did not, and I know that that story has appeared quite a bit, and I issued a statement yesterday. All right, thank you. Um, when you read the complaint, were you shocked at all by what you read? Congressman, Congresswoman, excuse me, um, as I said, I had a, life experience, a lot of life experience. I joined the Navy. I, I, I understand your record. Could you just well, what answer I mean is, it? I, I, realized the, I realized full well, full and well, the importance of the allegation. And I also have to tell you, Congressman, Congresswoman, when I saw that, I anticipated having to sit in front of some committee sometime to discuss it. All right, uh, the complaint refers to um, what happened after the July 25th uh, conversation between the Ukraine president and the president of the United States. And the White House lawyers ordered other staff to move the transcript from its typical repository uh, to a more secure location in order to lock down, and that was the term used in the complaint, all records of the phone call. Did you, um, did the, that reaction to the transcript seem to you like a recognition within the White House that the call was completely improper? 
Uh, Congresswoman, um, I have no firsthand knowledge of that. All I have is the knowledge that the whistleblower alleges uh, in his uh, allegation, the whistleblower complaint. I don't know whether, in fact, that, that is true or not. My only knowledge and situation awareness of that is from the whistleblower's letter. So knowing that the whistleblower appeared to be credible based on the evaluation by the Inspector General, and knowing that that effort was undertaken by the White House to cover it up, why would you then, as your first action outside of the intelligence community, go directly to the White House to the very entity that was being scrutinized and complained about in the complaint, why would you go there to ask their advice as to what you should do? Congresswoman, the allegation that is made by the whistleblower is secondhand information, not known to him or her firsthand. Except, Mr. McGuire, it was determined to be credible. There was an investigation done by the Inspector General. Uh, let me go on to another um, issue. Uh, President Trump, over the weekend, uh, tweeted, it appears that an American spy in one of our intelligence agencies may have been spying on our own president. Uh, do you believe that the whistleblower was spying on one of our intelligence agencies or spying on the president? As I said several times so far this morning, I believe that the whistleblower complied with the law and did everything that they thought, he or she thought, was responsible under the Intelligence uh, Community Whistleblower Protection Act. But you did not speak out to protect the whistleblower, did you? Congresswoman, I spoke Yes or out. no, sir? I did, yes. I did within my own workforce. I thought that there was enough stuff that was appearing out in the press that was erroneous, that was uh, absolutely uh, incorrect, and I didn't think that I needed to respond to every single statement that was out there that was incorrect. So what I did is my right, loyalty is to my workforce. I, I, I appreciate that. that thank yes, you. Um, the president on Monday said, also, who is this so-called whistleblower? Who, who knows the correct facts? Is he on our country's side? Do you believe the whistleblower is on our country's side? I believe that the whistleblower and all employees who come forward in the ICIG to raise concerns of fraud, waste, and abuse are doing what they perceive to be the right thing. So, working on behalf of our country. Are you aware of the fact that whistleblowers uh, within the federal government have identified waste, fraud, and abuse of over $59 billion that has had the effect of benefiting the taxpayers and keeping our country safe as well? Congresswoman, I'm not familiar with the um, dollar value, but having been in the, the government service for nearly four decades, I am very much aware of the value uh, of the Thank whistleblower you. program. Um, let me ask you one final question. Did the President of the United States ask you to find out the identity of the whistleblower? I can say, I, although I would not normally discuss my conversations with the President, I can tell you emphatically, no. Has anyone else within the White House or the Department of Justice asked you? No, Congresswoman. Thank no. you. I yield. You're welcome, ma'am. Mr. Stewart. Mr. McGuire, Mr. McGuire, thank you for being here today. Uh, I want you to know the good news is I'm not going to treat you like a child, and I'm going to give you a chance to answer your questions if I ask you something. I want to thank you for your service. And I'd like you to remind me, you said it earlier, how many years of service, uh, military service do you have? I have um, uh, 36 years of, uh, of service in the United States Navy, 34 of those as a Navy SEAL. Okay, that's, that's great. 36 years, 34 years as a Navy SEAL. I had a mere 14 years as an Air Force pilot. I proudly wear these Air Force wings. These are actually my father's Air Force wings. He served in the military as well as had, um, five of his sons. And for someone who hasn't served in the military, I don't think they realize how deeply offensive it is to have your honor and your integrity questioned. Some on this committee have done exactly that. They've accused you of breaking the law, and I'm gonna read just one, one part of many that I could from the chairman. This raises grave concerns that your office, together with the Department of Justice and possibly the White House, have engaged in an unlawful effort to protect the president. And there's others that I could read. 
as they have sought, I believe, to destroy your character. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to answer very clearly. Are you motivated by politics in your work or your professional behavior? Excuse me, sir. I'm sorry. Are you motivated by politics in your work or your professional behavior? No, Congressman. Okay, not I'm, at all. I'm just going to leave it there. I am not. I am, okay. I, am, I am not political. I am not partisan. And I did not look to be sitting here as the acting director of national intelligence. I thought that there were perhaps other people who would be best and more qualified to do that. But the president asked me to do this, and it was my honor to step up and for the however long I'm doing it to lead and support the intelligence community. Okay, thank you. Do you believe that you have followed the laws and policies and precedent in the way you've handled this complaint? I do. I know I do. I have you in any way sought to protect the president or anyone else from any wrongdoing? I have not. What I have done is endeavor to follow the law. Thank you. Do you believe that you had a legal responsibility to follow the guidance of the Office of Legal Counsel? The opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel is binding on the executive branch. Thank you. Now, there's been a big deal made about the fact that this is the first whistleblower complaint that has been withheld from Congress, but it's also true, isn't it, that it's the first whistleblower complaint that has potentially falls under executive privilege and it's also the first time that it included information that was potentially outside of the authority of the DNI. Is that true? To the best of my knowledge, Congressman, that is correct. Okay, and I will say to my colleagues sitting here, I think you're nuts. If you think you're going to convince the American people that your cause is just by attacking this man and by and impugning his character when it's clear that he felt there's a, a discrepancy, a potential deficiency in the law, he was trying to do the right thing. He felt compelled by the law to do exactly what he did. And yet the entire tone here is that somehow you're a political stooge who has done nothing but try to protect the president. And I just think that's nuts. And anyone watching this hearing is surely going to walk away with the clear impression that you are a man of integrity who did what you felt was right, regardless of the questions and the innuendo that is cast by some of my colleagues sitting here today. I'd like one more thing before I yield my time. I think we can agree that leaks are unlawful and that leaks are damaging. And for heaven's sakes, we've seen plenty of that over the last three years. And there's a long list of leaks that have had clear implications for our national security, meaningful implications for our national security. I want to know, do you know who was feeding the press information about this case? And have you made any referrals to the Department of Justice for unlawful disclosures? Yes, sir. Do you, do you know who is feeding information about this case? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> no, do you think it would be appropriate to make, uh, to make a referral to the Department of Justice to try to determine that? I believe that anybody who witnesses or sees any wrongdoing should refer any wrongdoing or complaint to the Department of Justice uh, for, uh, for uh, investigation. Including investigation about leaks. That is correct. Of classified information. Yes, Congressman, any wrongdoing. All right, well, I don't know what time it is because our clock isn't working. I suppose my time is up, but I would conclude by emphasizing once again, good luck convincing the American people that this is a dishonorable man sitting here. Good luck convincing the American people that he has done anything to what he thinks is right. And if you think it scores political points with your friends who have wanted to impeach this president from the day he was elected, then keep going down that road. Thank you, Congressman. I would only say, uh, Director, no one has accused you of being a political stooge or dishonorable. No one has said so. No one has suggested that. You've accused but him it of is, breaking but the law, Mr. Chairman. But it is certainly our strong view, and we would hope it would be shared by the minority, that when the Congress says that something shall be done, it shall be done. And when that involves the wrongdoing of the President, it is not an exception to the requirement of the statute. <clears throat> and the fact that this whistleblower has been left twisting in the wind now for weeks, uh, has been attacked by the President, should concern all of us, Democrats and Republicans, that this was ever allowed to come to be, that Allegations this serious and this urgent were withheld as long as they were from this committee. That should concern all of us. Um, but no one is suggesting that there is a dishonor here. But nonetheless, we are going to insist that the law be followed. Mr. Chairman, um, will you yield? Mr. Quigley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir, for your service and for being here. Uh, as you know, uh, those in public life who work and deal with other countries, ambassadors, secretaries of state, uh, many in the intelligence field, they're vetted. They go for approval before the Senate. They have to get clearance. Uh, and you understand the policy reasons for that, correct? Yes, Congressman. Uh, do you have any issues with civilians without approval, without vetting, without clearance, taking on those roles? Uh, yes, I do, Congressman. And, and why would you have those concerns? Well, um, in, order to be, uh, 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 be, in order to be able to handle sensitive information, whether it be diplomatic or certainly uh, intelligence information, one must be vetted. This is the important part of, prevent, uh, of uh, protecting national security. And in order to, you know, we just can't bring people in and automatically wave a magic wand to put holy water on them to give them a security clearance. It is a matter of vetting. For me to come back into government, the uh, FBI went back for 15 years, in my background, examined all of my financial records to make sure that I was, in fact, worthy of having an intelligence clearance. And we do the same thing with the intelligence community. Everybody who is subject or everybody who is privileged to have access to intelligence uh, information is a sacred trust. The American people expect us to keep them safe, as I said earlier. In order to do that, we need to ensure that any person who has access to this sensitive information of the United States has been thoroughly vetted to ensure that they are able to handle that information. It's not just the intel issues. It's the issues of, of national policy, that people have an official role that they carry out on behalf of the United States, and we know what their role is, correct? Yes, Congressman, I would. What is your understanding right now of what Mr. Giuliani's role is? <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Congressman, <laughs> Congressman Quigley, I, I respectfully just refer to the White House uh, and to comment on the president's personal lawyer. Uh, okay, so uh, so far what I've declaimed is you see that he's his personal lawyer. Uh, we read in the complaint, we read in this uh, modified transcript, he's mentioned five times your reaction to the fact that this civilian without any of these vetting has played this role. Um, no, sir. All I'm, I'm saying is that I know what the allegations are. I'm not saying that the allegations are true, and that's where the committee... Uh, well, I don't think there's any question the credibility of the complaint in the, in that's in the transcript the president mentions and speaks highly of Mr. Giuliani, a highly respected man. He was the mayor of New York, a graver. I would like him to, to call you. I will ask him to call you along with the attorney general. Your reaction of civilian dealing with these. In the complaint, it talks about our national security. The, the, the com, Inspector General talks about this as the highest responsibility among those that the DNI has, and obviously Mr. Giuliani is playing this role. To your knowledge, does he have security clearance? I don't know. Congressman Quigley, I, I, I'm neither aware or unaware whether or not uh, uh, Mr. Giuliani has a security clearance. Before this all happened, were you aware of his role or understanding what his role was doing what you do? Uh, Congressman Quigley, my only knowledge of what uh, uh, Mr. Giuliani does, I, I have to be honest with you, I get from TV and from the news media, I am not aware of what he does, in fact, for, for the president. You, I, are you I'm aware of to... his any communication by Mr. Giuliani and your office about how he should proceed with this role, given the classified nature, the national security implications that are in the complaint, that are in the transcript, in the role that he is playing? Well, I, I have read the transcripts just as you have, so my knowledge of his activity in there is uh, just limited to the conversation that the president had with the president of Ukraine. So we, we respect your role, and while we have differences of opinion, we continue to respect your, your integrity and your honor. But we have all this vast amount of experience you have, and we need to understand how it plays juxtaposition with the complaint. I'm reading, uh, an OMB official informed departments and agencies that the president earlier that month had issued instructions to suspend all U.S. security assistance to Ukraine. Your reaction to that? Congressman Quigley, I think that anything that has to do with the president's lawyer 
and these matters should be referred to to the White House and the President for that. Well, no, no, I'm just reading the I'm but just I, reading the complaint. I lead, I lead and I support the intelligence community and the 17 different departments and agencies underneath my leadership. I do not lead the President, and I have no authority or responsibility over the White House. But you are aware, with all your experience, of the fact that we have this relationship with Ukraine, that they are dependent upon us, and, and th this complaint doesn't concern you? You can't say that publicly that it concerns you? There's a lot of things that concern me. I'm the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, and this one here, though, I just have to defer back to the conversation that the President had is his conversation, how the President of the United States wants to conduct uh, diplomacy is his business, and I, it's not whether or not I approve it or disapprove of it. That is the president's business on how he wants to conduct that, sir. The issue is whether it commits a crime, and that bothers you. The, the, the time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the director, you may complete your answer if you wish. Excuse me, sir? If you wanted to respond, you may. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ms. Stefanik. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Thank you for being here. We appreciate your life of public service. Um, my question relates to Prior to the transmission on August 26th from the IG to the DNI, were there any conversations that you had with the IG prior to August 26th related to this matter? Uh, Congresswoman, there's been a lot that's happened in the last several weeks. Um, as far as the timeline is concerned, I think that uh, I'd, I'd like to take that and get back to you and give you a full chronology, if I may, on the actual timeline of events. That would be very helpful to this committee in terms of if there were any preliminary conversations, what was discussed, and if there was any action taken as a result of those conversations. I want to turn to the complaint itself, which is made public for the, Ameri for the American public to read. And let me preface this by saying that I greatly appreciate your statement that you believe the whistleblower is operating in good faith. I think that's very important for Americans to hear. But on page one, and I'm not going to improvise for parity purposes like the chairman of this committee did. I'm going to quote it directly. On page one, the complaint reads, quote, I was not a direct witness to most of the events described. This seems like a very important line to look into. And I think the American public will have questions in particular about that line. So my question to you is, for the record, did the IG fully investigate the allegations into this complaint? at this time? Has the IG fully investigated the allegations in this complaint? As I said earlier, Congresswoman, I believe that the Intelligence Community Inspector General did a thorough investigation with the 14-day time frame that he had, and under that timeline, to the best of his ability, made the determination that it was both credible and urgent. I have no reason to doubt that Michael Atkinson did anything but uh, his, his, his job. Sure, so when you talk about a full investigation, were the veracity of the allegations in the complaint looked into? There were many references to uh, White House officials. Do you know if the IG spoke with those White House officials? Do you know if he investigated, again, the truthfulness of these allegations? Or was it a preliminary investigation? Congresswoman, I, I'd have to defer to the IG to respond to you on that. But uh, to all I do know, uh, I do, although I do not know the identity of the whistleblower, I do know that uh, Michael Atkinson had, in fact, you know, discussed this with the whistleblower and found his complaint to be uh, credible. As far as who else he spoke with, I am unaware of what went on in Michael Atkinson's investigation into this matter. So, as of today, the only individual that we know the, the IG spoke with is the, auth is the complainant, is the author and the whistleblower. No, Congresswoman, what I'm saying is I'm unaware who else Michael Atkinson may have spoken to. I'm just unfamiliar with his uh, investigative process and everybody that he spoke to in this regard. Thank you for the answer on the record. Again, for the American public, they're going to have many questions as they read this complaint today. And because on page one it says no direct knowledge, I think it's very important that we uh, conduct are, that we have questions answered for individuals that do have direct knowledge. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman. Mr. Swalwell. Thank you. Mr. McGuire, do you agree that the definition of a cover-up is an attempt to prevent people from discovering a crime? I'd say that's um, close. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure there's others one, but I don't disagree with that, sir. 
And in the whistleblower's complaint, the whistleblower alleges that immediately after the president's call with the president of Ukraine on July 25, White House lawyers moved quickly to direct White House officials to move electronic transcripts from one computer system where it was normally stored to a secret classified information system. Is that right? Congresswoman, excuse me, sir, I apologize. Congressman, is, is that what was alleged in the whistleblower complaint? Congressman. Um, yes or no? All, sir, all, all I know is that is the allegation. No, is that what, it, I'm asking you that, that's that, what's alleged. That's the allegation. And you Whether read that allegation, and the first people that you go to after you read that allegation are the White House lawyers who are telling the White House officials who see this transcript and move it into a secret compartmentalized system. Those are the first people you go to. Well, let's say a couple of things. Is that One, yes or no? Yes, but Okay, also. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going here. So you get this complaint. Inspector General says, urgent, credible. You have no wiggle room to not go to Congress, and instead you send your concern to the subject of the complaint, the White House. So did the White House tell you after you sent your concern about privilege, did they tell you to go to the Department of Justice next? We, my, my team, my counsel, in consultation with the intelligence community inspector general went to uh, the Office of Legal Counsel. So, and they, we were not directed to do that. We, and Mr. McGuire, you said that this did not involve ongoing intelligence activities. However, the whistleblower says that this is not the first time that the president's transcripts with foreign leaders were improperly moved to an intelligence community code word system. Is that a part of the allegation? I believe that's in the letter, and I will let the letter speak for itself, sir. Well, what can also speak for itself is that if a transcript with a foreign leader is improperly moved into an intelligence community classification system, that actually would involve your responsibilities. Is that right? Not necessarily. That is, I do not, it is not underneath my authority and responsibility. And once again, this is an allegation that has been made, does not necessarily mean that that is a true statement. And the allegation was determined to be urgent and credible by the Inspector General. Is that right? Yes, it was. So. Would you also want to know, though, considering that you are the Director of National Intelligence and transcripts are being moved into a secret intelligence system, whether other transcripts, perhaps maybe the President's phone calls with Vladimir Putin, with uh, MBS of Saudi Arabia, or Erdogan of Turkey, or Kim Jong-un, would you want to know if those were also being improperly moved because the President is trying to cover up something? Congressman, uh, how the White House the office of the, uh, the executive office of the president, then the National Security Council conduct their business is their business. Well, it's actually your business to protect America's secrets. Is that right? It's all of ours, this committee as well. And if there's cover-up activity because the president is working improperly with a foreign government, that could compromise America's secrets. Is that right? Congressman, there is an allegation of a cover-up. I'm sure an investigation and before this committee might lead credence or just prove that. But right now, all we have is an allegation, an allegation for secondhand information from a whistleblower. I and have no knowledge on whether or not that is true and accurate statement. The Department of Justice opinion you relied upon said that you are not responsible per, for preventing foreign election interference. Is that right? That was in the opinion. What the Office of Legal Counsel did was over 11 pages well, no, they, render they an said, opinion defining and explaining their justification for it not complying with urgent concerns. Are you responsible for preventing election interference? Election interference. By a foreign government. Congressman, election interference. I hope you know this answer is yes or no. Are you responsible for preventing election interference? My, my, my election interference is Boy, I really, it I really is the hope top you know priority the answer to this in the intelligence community. Is it your priority, though? Yes, it is. Okay, so this complaint also alleges a shakedown with a foreign government by the United States president inv involving a rogue actor, as Mr. Quigley pointed out, who has no clearance, no authority under the United States, and an effort by the White House to move the transcript of this call to a secret system. Is that right? That's at least what's alleged. Congressman, I believe that election security is my most fundamental priority. However, this complaint focused on a conversation by the president with another foreign leader, not election security. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. And if that conversation involved the president
requesting help in the form of intervention in our election? Is that not an issue of interference in our election? Chairman, once again, this was sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. No, I understand that, but, but you're not suggesting, are you, that the President is somehow immune from the laws that preclude a U.S. person from seeking foreign help in a U.S. election, are you? What I, I am saying, Chairman Schiff, is that no one, none of us, is above the law in this country. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Chairman. Admiral, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I tell all my friends all the time that I've gotten more surveillance as a member of Congress than I did as an undercover officer in the CIA. And I think you've gotten more arrows shot at you, you know, since you've been DNI than you did in your almost four decades on the battlefield. Um, a specific question, um, the letter that's contained in the whistleblower package, it's actually dated August 12th, and I recognize this may be a better question to be asking the ICIG. Um, that letter is dated August 12th, and it's to the chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and to the chairman of this committee. Do you know if the whistleblower provided that letter to those two chairmen uh, concurrently with the ICIG? Uh, uh, no, Congressman. I, as I said earlier, I believe that the whistleblower and the ICIG acted in good faith and followed the law every step of the way. Good, good, good copy. Um, we, we've talked about the way the law on, on, on the whistleblower statute is, is, um, says you shall share if it's decided to be an urgent concern. However, best practices has always been uh, to share regardless of whether that urgent concern. Um, do you see any reason, um, a negative impact on the intelligence community if that legislation was changed to say all whistleblower complaints should be shared with, with the committees? That, that, that's correct. And, and in addition to that, Congressman, I mean, let's just say the allegation was made against a member of this committee. I, you know, members of this committee, although you are in the Intelligence Committee, are not members of the intelligence community. And as the DNI, I have no authority or responsibility over this committee. But, but my, my question is, do you think that if every whistleblower complaint that was brought to the intelligence community inspector general was always shared with this committee, would that have any impact on intelligence equities? Uh, be, be, and, and I ask that because I don't know why, when the statute was written, that it didn't say all should be shared rather than only urgent concern. And my question to you as the head of the intelligence community, do you think if we change that law, would it have impact on intelligence equities. I, I don't think that a law could be changed to cover all things that might possibly happen. I think we have a good law. I think it is well written. However, as I said, Congressman, this is unprecedented and this is a unique situation. Why this one is, uh, it, this is why we're sitting here this morning. Sure, and I hope we're not in this position again. Um, however, if we do find ourselves in this position again, I want to make sure that there is not any uncertainty in when information should be shared to this committee. Um, was the ODNI, or under you or under your predecessor, aware of an OMB decision to suspend Ukrainian aid, as was alleged in this complaint? Uh, as far as I am concerned personally, uh, Congressman, no, I have no knowledge of that, and I am unaware if anybody within the ODNI is aware of that. I just don't know the answer to that. Um, when, the, and, and again, I apologize for a lot of these legal questions that may be best directed at somebody else, but I feel like you have a perspective. Um, when does OLC, Office of Legislative... Legal Counsel. Legal Counsel, excuse me, uh, guidance override laws passed by Congress? The Office of Legal Counsel does not override laws passed by Congress. What it does is it passes legal opinion for those of us who are in the executive branch. And the Office of Legal Counsel legal opinion is binding to everyone within the executive branch. Good copy. And, and I have two final questions, and I'm gonna ask them together to give you the, the time to answer yes, sir. Uh, them both. Um, what is your assessment of how intelligence operations in general are going to be impacted by this latest episode? And when I say episode, I'm referring to uh, the, the media circus, the political circus, 
the technical issues that are related to this whistleblower revelation. You alluded to it in some of your previous questions, but I, I, would, I would like your, your assessment on how this can impact intelligence operations in the future. And I do believe this is your first time testifying to Congress in your position, right? Um, and I, I would welcome in the end, I know this is off, a little off topic, what do you see our greatest challenges and threats to this country as the Director of National Intelligence? Well, um, I, I, let me answer the, the latter part of that. I think that, that the greatest challenge that we face is not necessarily you know, from a kinetic strike or with Russia or China or Iran or North Korea. I think the greatest challenge that we do have is to make sure that we maintain the integrity of our election system. We know right now you know, that there are foreign powers who are trying to get us to question the validity on whether or not our, law, our elections are valid. So first and foremost, I think that protecting the, the sanctity uh, of our election within the United States, whether it be uh, national, city, state, and local, is perhaps the most important job that we have with the intelligence community. Outside of that, we do face significant threats. I'd say number one is not necessarily kinetic, but cyber. This is a cyber world. We talk about whether or not the great competition is taking place uh, with Russia and China, and we are you know, building ships and uh, weapons to do that. But in my estimation, the great competition with these countries is taking place right now and is doing that in the cyber realm. Admiral, my, my time is, I think, running out, yes, but the, the broader implications on intelligence operations of this current whistleblower situation. Well, I will tell you, um, in light of this, I clearly have a lot of work as the leader of this community to do, you know, to reassure, my, uh, to reassure uh, that, uh, you know, the intelligence community that, in fact, you know, that we, I am totally committed to the whistleblower program. And I am absolutely, absolutely committed to protecting the anonymity of this individual, as well as making sure that Michael Atkinson, who is our ICIG, continues to be able to his, do his job unfettered. But I think that with that, I certainly have to be proactive in my communications with my team. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the time I may Thank or you, may sir. not have. <laughs> Mr. Castro. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director McGuire, for your testimony today. I want to say thank you also to the whistleblower for having the courage and the bravery to come forward on behalf of the nation. Uh, thank you to Mr. Atkinson, also the Inspector General, for um, his courage in coming forward to Congress. You mentioned that you believe that the whistleblower's report is, is credible, that the whistleblower is credible, uh, that the whistleblower acted in good faith. Uh, you've had a chance now, as we have, and I believe the American people have, had an opportunity to review both the whistleblower complaint and the transcript that was released of the phone call between the President of the United States and the President of the Ukraine. You've read both documents by now, haven't you? Yes, Congressman. Would you say that the whistleblower's complaint is remarkably consistent with the transcript that was released? I would say that uh, the whistleblower's con uh, complaint is in alignment uh, with what was released yesterday by the, the President. Okay, I wanna read you a quick section of both to underscore exactly how accurate and consistent this complaint is. On page two of the whistleblower's complaint, the whistleblower says, according to the White House officials who had direct knowledge of the call, the president pressured Mr. Zelensky to, and then there's a few bullet points, the first one says, initiate or continue an investigation into the activities of former Vice President Joseph Biden and his son Hunter Biden and the third bullet point, meet or speak with two people the president named explicitly as his personal envoys on these matters, Mr. Giuliani and Attorney General Barr, to whom the president referred multiple times in tandem. In the transcript that was released on page four of the first paragraph into what looks like the third sentence, President Trump says, the former ambassador from the United States, the woman, was bad news, and the people she was dealing with in the Ukraine were bad news, so I just wanna let you know that. The other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people wanna find out about that, so whatever you can do with the Attorney General would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution, et cetera. Do you have reason to doubt what the whistleblower has brought forward? Getting back into Michael Atkinson's um, determination on whether or not it was credible 
or urgent concern. As the DNI, it is not my place to ensure that it is credible. That is the ICIG's job as the inspector. He has determined that it is credible. My only trouble was that, in fact, it involves someone who is not in the intelligence community or in an organization under which I have authority and responsibility. Outside but, of that- But Director McGuire, you agree that it involved intelligence matters. It involved an issue of election interference. It involved an investigation of U.S. persons, including a former vice president. If you had knowledge, or the CIA had knowledge, that a government was going to investigate or drum up an investigation against a former vice president, would that not class, that, that wouldn't qualify as an intelligence matter? Would that qualify as an intelligence matter, yes or no? It, well, I don't mean to say that's kind of a hypothetical question, sir. No, I, I don't think it's hypothetical. No, well, it, that's, that's exactly what's in the transcript. That's what he's asking for. What the complaint, the complaint. But that's what the president is asking the, the president of the Ukraine to do. He's asking the president of the Ukraine to investigate a former vice president of the United States. Does that qualify as an intelligence matter that the CIA would want to know? The conversation was by the president to the president of Ukraine, as you know, and it is his, I am, I am not. But Mr. McGuire, I understand, but that cannot be, that cannot be an ultimate shield against transparency. It can't be an ultimate shield against accountability. The president is not above the law. One thing that you haven't told us is if, if, if your office or if the inspector general is not able to investigate, then who is able to investigate? Uh, Congressman Castro, once again, sir, as I mentioned several times so far, although it did not come to the committee, the complaint was referred to the Judicial Department for Criminal Investigation. This was not swept under the rug. I have, I have one more question for you. Why did your office think you should appeal the IG's determination about quote unquote urgent concern to the DOJ? That has never been done before. It's never been done before. This is unprecedented in that in the past that there has never been a matter that the Inspector General has investigated that did not involve a member of the intelligence community or an organization that the Director of National Intelligence... One last point I would make with respect to, you keep saying the President is not part of the intelligence community. I believe he is. The President, you agree, has the ability to declassify any single intelligence document. Do you agree that's true? The President has original classification authority. How, then how is that person outside of the intelligence community? Excuse me. He is the President of the United States above the entire executive branch. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Radcliffe. Thank you, Chairman. Admiral, good to see you. Good to see you again, sir. Uh, you served in the Navy 36 years. You commanded SEAL Team 2, and you retired as Vice Admiral of the Navy, correct? That's correct, Congressman. All right. And uh, despite the fact that uh, after that service, uh, you became acting DNI 23 days after the trump Zelensky call and four days after the whistleblower made his or her complaint, uh, you were subpoenaed before this committee after being publicly accused of committing a crime, correct? Yes, Congressman. Chairman Schiff wrote a letter on September 13th accusing you of being part of an, quote, unlawful cover-up, and then the Speaker of the House took it one step further. She went on national TV and said not once but twice that you broke the law, that you committed a crime. She said, the acting director of national intelligence blocked him, meaning the ICIG, from disclosing the whistleblower complaint. This is a violation of the law. Um, you were publicly accused of committing a crime. You were also falsely accused of committing a crime. As you have so uh, accurately related, you were required to follow not just an opinion of what the law is, but the opinion from the Justice Department, an 11-page opinion about whether or not you were required by law to report the whistleblower complaint, correct? That's correct, Congressman Ryan. And that, and that opinion says, the question is whether such a complaint falls within the statutory definition of urgent concern that the law requires the DNI to forward to the Intelligence Committee. We conclude that it does not. Did I read that accurately? <laughs> yes, I better have, right? Um, that's an opinion not from Bill Barr. That's an opinion from the Department of Justice ethics lawyers, not political appointees, 
but career officials that serve Republicans and Democrats, the ethics lawyers at the J Department of Justice that determined that you did follow the law. So you were publicly accused, you were also falsely accused, and yet here today, I haven't heard anything close to an apology for that. Uh, welcome to the House of Representatives with Democrats in charge. Um, let me turn to the uh, matter that we're here for. A lot of talk about this whistleblower complaint. Um, the question is, at this point, given what we have, why all the focus on this whistleblower? The best evidence of what President Trump said to President Zelensky is a transcript of what President Trump said to President Zelensky. I'm not casting aspersions on the whistleblower's good faith or their intent, but a secondhand account of something someone didn't hear isn't as good as the best evidence of what was actually said. And to that point, Despite good faith, the whistleblower is in fact wrong uh, in numerous respects. And I know everyone's not going to have time to read the whistleblower's complaint, but the whistleblower says that I am deeply concerned, talking about the president, that there was a serious or flagrant problem, abuse, or violation of the law. The whistleblower then goes on to say, uh, I was not a direct witness to the events described. However, I found my colleagues' accounts of this to be credible. And then talking about those accounts of which this whistleblower complaint is based on, the whistleblower tells us the officials that I spoke with told me, and I was told that, and I learned from multiple U.S. officials that, and White House officials told me that, and I also learned from multiple U.S. officials that. In other words, all of this is secondhand information. None of it is firsthand information. The whistleblower then goes on to cite additional sources besides those secondhand information. Those sources happen to include mainstream media. The sources that the whistleblower bases his complaints on include the Washington Post, the New York Times, Politico, The Hill, uh, Bloomberg, ABC News, and others. In other words, much like the Steele dossier, the allegations in the whistleblower's complaints are based on third-hand uh, mainstream media sources rather than first-hand information. The whistleblower also appears to allege crimes not just against um, the president, but says with regard to this scheme to uh, solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 election that, quote, the president's personal lawyer, Mr. Rudolph Giuliani, is a central figure in this effort, and Attorney General Barr appears to be involved as well. But buried in a footnote, a couple of, page later, a couple of pages later, the whistleblower admits, I do not know the extent to which, if at all, Mr. Giuliani is directly coordinating his efforts on the Ukraine with Attorney General Barr. Attorney General does know because he issued a statement yesterday saying there was no involvement. Um, my point in all of this is, again, the transcript is the best evidence of what we have. And so that the American people are very clear what that transcript relates is legal communications. The United States is allowed to solicit help from a foreign government in an ongoing criminal investigation, which is exactly what President Trump did in that conversation. So if the Democrats are intent on impeaching the president for lawful conduct, then be my guest. I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Ratcliffe. Mr. Heck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director, thank you for being here, sir. Thank you very much for your service. I want to step back a little bit and kind of put into perspective, I think, what's at stake here. Obviously, yesterday, the White House released the transcript of that July 25th conversation between President Trump and President Zelensky. And we now know that this phone call was indeed a part of the whistleblower complaint. Yesterday, the chair at a press conference characterized the president's uh, conversation in that call as a shakedown of the Ukrainian leader. Uh, he was not suggesting that it was a shakedown for either information or money, but instead it was a shakedown for help to win a presidential election, which is coming up next year. So now let's fast rewind to May 7th of this year when FBI Director Christopher Wray testified before the United States Senate that, and I'm quoting now, any public official or member of any campaign should re immediately report to the FBI any conversations with foreign actors about, quote, 
influencing or interfering with our election. Now, Director Ray is, of course, the top cop in the United States of America. You agree with Director Ray, do you not, sir? Uh, Congressman Heck, uh, I do not disagree with uh, Director Ray. And is that the same what, thing as that, you agree with him, sir? Yes. Okay, Once thank again, you. The, Let me go on. It fast was referred, forward. It was referred to the FBI. Let me fast forward. Yes, sir. Was it referred to the FBI by the president who actually engaged in the conversation? The um, No, it was not. Let me fast forward to June 13th, when uh, that's five weeks in advance of that, when the chair of the Federal Elections Commission made the following statement. Follow me, please. Let me make something 100% clear to the American public and anyone running for public office. It is illegal for any person to accept, solicit, or receive anything of value from a foreign national in connection with the U.S. election. This is not a novel concept. Election intervention from foreign governments has been considered unacceptable since the beginnings of our nation. Do you agree with the FEC Chair Weintraub, Mr. Director? I, I, I agree that uh, our elections are sacred and we, uh, uh, any interference from an outside source is, uh, is just not, not what we want to and do. And to solicit or accept it is illegal. I don't know about that. I'm not a lawyer, sir. I don't mean to be evasive, but I, I, I can't. So you think it is okay for a public official to solicit, or it may be okay. You do not know the law in this regard. You think it may be okay for a candidate or an elected official to solicit foreign interference in our election? I cannot believe you're saying that. You're not really saying that, right? No, I'm not saying that, uh, Congressman Heck, at all. So we should note that the FEC chair was prompted to say this because it was just literally... Uh, literally the day before that the President of the United States sat at the Resolute Desk in the most iconic room in the United States, the Oval Office, and said that FBI Director Ray was wrong. You're obviously disagreeing with that. He also said that he'd be, he would consider accepting foreign help. Uh, and of course, yesterday, we learned that the President did in fact, did in fact do exactly that, solicited that help. Director, whether it's this president or any president, do you believe it is okay for the President of the United States to pressure a foreign country into helping him or her win an election? Uh, Congressman uh, Heck, I believe that no one is above the law, and we've discussed what we think applies to the law. So it is illegal to solicit? No, I can't answer that. I, once again, sir. I can't reconcile your two statements. Is it okay for a president to pressure any president to pressure a foreign government for help to win an election? It is unwarranted, it is unwelcome, it is bad for the nation to have outside interference, any foreign Thank power. Thank you. Uh, and, and by extension, it would be equally unacceptable to extort that assistance as well. I mean, all I know is that I have the transcripts as you have. I have the whistleblower complaint as you have. And I, I wasn't referring to the whistleblower complaint, but if any president were to do this, and I accept your answer, I, I think it's beyond unacceptable, Director. Yes, sir. I think it's wrong, and I think we all know it. I think we were taught this at a very young age, and there's a voice within most of us, unfortunately, evidently not all of us, that suggests that it is wrong. It is illegal and it is wrong. And I thank you, sir, and with that, I yield back. But, C Congressman, if I may just ask, as answer once again. It, I've run out of time, sir. No, you've got... Oh, you Director, won't. you may answer. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Director, go Director, go ahead. You, feel free to I, I, respond. Once again, it was referred to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Not by the President. No, by, the, by this office. Right. And, and by the... Um, uh, office of uh, Le uh, and uh, by the uh, ICIG. Director Ray said that any candidate or elected official should immediately report it. He didn't say that the director of O&I should re report it, although you should and you did, thank you, but the person involved did not do what Director Ray said should occur, period. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. Uh, director, 
I want to say thank you. There's nobody in this room who can claim to have served their country longer and more val valiantly than you. Uh, and I heard in your opening remarks that your family before you has been committed uh, to this country. And I say thank you. Uh, second, I appreciated your candor when, uh, in your opening statement, you acknowledged that the whistleblower acted in good faith. Uh, and third, I appreciated your acknowledgement that the Inspector General also acted in good faith and according to his view of the law. Uh, and I want to say this. Uh, when you said you were in a unique, a unique position, <laughs> that's an understatement. You got a complaint involving uh, the President of the United States and also the United States Attorney General. Uh, I disagree with some of the decisions you made, but I have no doubt whatsoever that the same sense of duty uh, that you applied in your long and illustrious career guided you as you made these decisions. So thank you for that. But I want to ask a few questions about the extraordinary document uh, that came to your attention. Uh, the DNI has jurisdiction over foreign interference in our elections, correct? That's, that's correct. And of course, you're aware, as we all are, of the Mueller report and his indictments against uh, 12 foreign nationals, Russians, who actively interfered in our election, correct? Uh, I have read the report, yes. Yeah, so it's just a huge responsibility uh, that your agency has, correct? Uh, and, and in this case, uh, because of the two things you mentioned, uh, that the president is the one person that's above the intelligence community in your sense about executive privilege, you, didn't for, you did not forward the complaint to us, correct? I did not forward, yes, Congressman Welsh, because I was still working with the White House. No, I, un I understand sir. that. You, yes, you've been very clear on that. But let me just ask a, a hypothetical just to show the dilemma yes, that you were in. Let's say a U.S. senator who is well-connected, or a private citizen really well-connected, had access to and had a conversation as a result of that with a foreign, uh, the leader of a foreign country, and asked that person for a favor, uh, the U.S. senator, let's say, of providing dirt on a political opponent. Is that something that you would see that should be forwarded to this committee? Uh, Congressman, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it's very difficult to answer hypothetical questions. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Well, I won't Is make it, it hypothetical. Let's say instead of being a conversation between President uh, and the President of Ukraine, it was a U.S. Senator who, let's say, right. was the head of the Foreign Relations Committee and was asking for uh, the That's foreign the leader. I understand. So yes, would sir. you forward that to our committee? Sir, that would not be, once again, I think I mentioned that a little bit early in our conversation that uh, the United States Senator is not a member of the intelligence community. And the Director of National Intelligence you know, does not have the authority and responsibility for the U.S. Senate. So any long, wrongdoing in that regard should be referred to the Department of Justice for criminal investigation. Right, well, I'd respectfully disagree with you because obviously that would be a solicitation by that U.S. Senator for interference in our elections, and that's in your jurisdiction, correct? Well, it, election, election interference is a date. Yeah, yes, Congressman Walsh. Okay. And but once again, Congressman, although it is, as far as what the legal responsibility to do in compliance with the Intelligence Reform Act, the Whistleblower Protection Act, it does not, the statute does not allow for that to be done. Well, I disagree with that. Yes, sir. But, but here, here's the dilemma that you were in and we're in, but we're going to now be able to follow up because executive privilege, if it existed, was waived. Under your approach, as you saw it, it means that no one would be investigating the underlying conduct because, in this case, executive privilege applies or may apply. And number two, the president who had the conversation is above the law. So that's a dilemma for our democracy. Is it not? The complaint was sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, totally disregarding any uh, uh, c concern for no, executive I, privilege. I understand. But the, the, the Federal Bureau of Investigation never did a follow-up investigation, right? I, I believe that they have concluded the investigation. I'm not sure. In addition to 
being involved with this matter here. I also have other pressing matters. As and, director, I apologize. And the Justice Department, led by uh, Mr. Barr, who is a subject of uh, the complaint, uh, is the department that provided the opinion that there's no action to be taken. I, I believe that the Attorney General was mentioned in the complaint, not Correct. necessarily subject of the complaint, sir. Well, he was, ma <laughs> he was mentioned. Yes, sir. All right, I yield back. Thank you. Congressman Wells, thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Maloney. Director McGuire, what was your first day on the job? <laughs> My first day on the job was uh, Friday the 16th of um, August, and I think I set a new record in the administration for being subpoenaed before any yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. You, you had a heck of a first week, didn't you, sir? Not that much going for me, sir. Uh, the complaint uh, is dated August 12th. Um, whatever else you've done right in your career, sir, your timing is... Uh, is, is, it's got to be something you worry about. Oh, Congressman, I think that Dan Coates' timing is better than mine. <laughs> Sir, look, it, there's been a lot of talk here today about the process. I, I, I just want to just summarize a couple of things, if that's okay. Yes, sir. So you're, you're, in your first couple days on the job, sir, you're, you're hit with this complaint. And, and it says that the President of the United States pressured a foreign leader uh, to help him investigate a political opponent, um, and, and that political opponent's son, in fact. Um, that that president asked the foreign leader to, to work with a private citizen, Mr. Giuliani, and the Attorney General of the United States, Bill Barr, um, on that scheme. The president at that time, not in dispute, was withholding $391 million of assistance, holding that over that Ukrainian president's head. That Ukrainian president raises in the conversation how U.S. military assistance, javelins, defensive weapons. He's got Russian troops in his country. The wolf is at the door. The president asks for a favor, complains about Ukrainian reciprocity. Not getting enough from you, that's what reciprocity is, right? We gotta get something from you if we're giving something to you. He names the political opponents by name, the Bidens. The Ukrainian president says he'll do it, that he'll do the investigation. That's what you're hit with. And you're looking at that complaint that in the second paragraph alleges serious wrongdoing by the President of the United States. And the first thing you do is go to the President's men at the White House and women and say, should I give it to Congress? And in the second paragraph of that complaint, sir, it also suggests the Attorney General could be involved. And the second thing you do is go to the Attorney General's people at the Justice Department and ask them if you should give it to Congress. Sir, I have no question about your character. I've read your bio. I have some questions about your decision and, and the judgment in those decisions. See any conflicts here? <laughs> Congressman uh, Maloney, I, I, I have a lot of leadership experience. I do. And as you said, it came to me very early on in this. The fact that I was just, I am the acting DNI, and I was still using Garmin to get to work. That this came to my attention involving the President of the United States and the important matter of this. In the past, as I said before, I have always worked with legal counsel. Because of the magnitude but, and the importance but, sir, of this I decision, may. I just, sir, as a, as, a, as a naval officer for years, I just thought it would be prudent. I understand now, I the also want to say, sir, if I may, my life would have been a heck of a lot simpler without becoming the most famous man of the United Don't States. Don't doubt that at all, sir. Okay. My question, sir, is, is when you were considering prudence, did you think it was prudent to give a veto power over whether the Congress saw this serious allegation of wrongdoing to the two people implicated by it? Is that prudent? I have to work with the situation as it is, Congressman Maloney. Only the White House can determine or waive executive privilege. There is no one else to go to. And as far as a second opinion, my only avenue of that was to go to the Department of Justice Office of Legal Counsel. And you understand, you understand, sir, that if unchallenged by your own Inspector General, your decision, that prudence, would have prevented these serious allegations from ever reaching the Congress. Quick question, in response to Mr. Himes, I think you left the door open that you spoke to the President of the United States about this whistleblower complaint. Sir, did you speak personally to the President of the United States at any time about this complaint? 
Congressman, once again, I am the President's intelligence officer. I speak to the President. I, I cannot say one Mr. Way Director, I know you speak to the President a lot. It's a simple question, sir. Did you speak to him about this whistleblower complaint? Yes or no? Congressman Maloney, my conversation with the President of the United States is privileged. So you're not denying that you spoke to the President? I'm not asking for the content, sir. I don't want the content. Did you or did you not speak to the President about this whistleblower complaint? I speak to the President about a lot of things, and anything that I say to the President of the United States in any forum is privileged. Not asking for the content. Are you denying that you spoke to the President? I am just telling you once again, I speak to the President, and anything I say to the President is confidential. Thank you, sir. Sir, yeah, I mean, that's the way it is. I understand. Thank you. And, Director, you understand we're not asking you about your conversations with the President, about national security, about foreign policy, about the National Counterterrorism Center. We just want to know, did you discuss this subject with the President? You could imagine what a profound conflict of interest that would be. Did you discuss this subject, this whistleblower plane, with the President? You can say, I did not discuss it with him, if that's the answer. That doesn't betray any privilege. And you can say, I did discuss it with him, but I'm not going to get into the content of those conversations. That question you can answer. Chairman Schiff, once again, you know, my conversation, no matter what the subject is with the President of the United States, is privileged conversation between the Director of National Intelligence and the President. Ms. Demings. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and um, Director McGuire. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for your service. Good morning, Congresswoman. Um, I know you said that you took your first oath in 1974. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's, that's a long time, but a long time to be proud of the service. I took my first oath in 1984. Uh, when I was sworn in as a law enforcement officer. And I thank you so much for saying that public service is a sacred trust because regardless of the circumstances or who's involved, public service is a sacred trust. Uh, I've had an opportunity as a law enforcement officer, I'm a member of Congress now, but to investigate internal cases involving other personnel. I've had an opportunity to investigate numerous other cases criminal cases, and never once, just for the record, Director McGuire, did I ever go to the suspect or the defendant or the principal in those cases to ask them what I should do um, in the case. There's been a lot of talk this morning, the whole discussion, the whole reason why we're here centers around the U.S. relationship uh, with Ukraine. I think you would agree that Ukraine is very dependent on the United States in terms of assisting them in defending themselves. Could you, based on your many years of experience in the military and now in your new position, talk a little bit about that relationship and how important it is for the United States to assist Ukraine if they're ever going to be able to, to defend themselves? Uh, yes, Congressman, I think that uh, the United States has been extremely supportive of Ukraine. I would say that they are relying on us as they rely on other people in Europe. And I, I would also say that the United States is probably paying more of their fair share for the support of, Europe, of Ukraine uh, than the others. Uh, the threats are real for the Ukrainian people, and uh, the stake of uh, freedom and uh, democracy is also, even though it's in the Ukraine, is also a very much a concern. So based on that, you would say Ukraine probably could never get there without the support and the assistance of the United States or from the United States of America? I would say that if others were willing to step up and support, they might be able to get there. But they are not. We are, we are, we're there. And so I think you've said it would be difficult for Ukraine to meet that goal of defending themselves without our support, correct? I would say it would be a challenge, yes, Congresswoman. This complaint outlines a scheme by the President of the United States, and I'm not really sure what to call Rudy Giuliani these days, what his role is. Maybe he's the new fixer, I'm not sure. But either way, it involves a scheme to coerce Ukraine, this country that you say is so very dependent on the United States to defend themselves, to coerce Ukraine and to assist in the president's reelection efforts in 2020. In the report from your Inspector General, uh, the memo that was sent to you, it says on July 18th, 
The Office of Management and Budget official informed the departments and agencies that the president earlier that month had issued instructions to suspend all U.S. security assistance to Ukraine. Neither OMB nor the NSC staff knew why this instruction had been issued. During interagency meetings on the 23rd of July and the 26th of July, OMB officials again stated explicitly that the instruction to suspend this assistance had come directly from the president, but they were not, but they were still unaware of a policy rationale. So the 23rd, 26th, uh, on the 18th, this issue first came up where the president was assent, uh, rescinding or suspending that assistance that you said Ukraine so desperately depends on. D Director McGuire, we deal in what's reasonable here. And I believe your inspector general included that in the report because this whole issue of, is about Ukraine's position, relationship with the United States, their dependency on the United States, and the president's efforts to coerce Ukraine into engaging in an illegal and improper investigation. Do you believe that's why your inspector general added that about suspending their support to Ukraine? I think that Michael Atkinson found it to, to be credible and he viewed that it was a matter of urgent concern to forward to this committee. Do you think it's reasonable for the American people and for this committee on both sides to believe that there is a correlation or a nexus between the president suspending the aid and the conversation that took place on the, the follow-up conversation? Yes, Congresswoman, that is the allegation that is made, and I did not have access to the transcripts my only information was the ICIG's cover letter and the allegation, whistleblower allegation. The other information coming to light yesterday, as released by the president, uh, changes things in different light. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I just ask one more, just quickly, very, one more quickly Without question. Objection. My understanding is that the attorney, the inspector general, is a career intelligence person. He's worked in the Department of Justice. He's received numerous awards for outstanding exemplary performance. Did you have any reason to deny or not believe his conclusions in every area of this report that he was directly involved in? Congresswoman, Michael Atkinson is a valued and trusted colleague. I respect him tremendously. The question came down to, as we just over and over again, urgent concern and whether or not the intelligence uh, community whistleblower protection act as written allows me to forward it to this committee that's where i got stuck ma'am and i'm sorry thank you direct thank you congresswoman mr christian murthy uh mr mcguire thank you so much for your service to our country and thank you for your patriotism um i want to ask you uh, a couple questions about um the time surrounding july 25th uh, to the time that you came into uh, office as DNI. As you know, the phone call between President Trump and uh, the Ukrainian president happened on July 25th of this year, correct? I believe July 25th, I believe so. At least one of them happened on July 25th. At that time, the DNI was Dan Coates and his deputy was Sue Gordon. As you know, the whistleblower claim was filed on August 12th of this year and then you took office um, on August 16th, four yes, days later. Yes, sir. Prior to taking your new job, or since, did you discuss the July 25th call or the whistleblower complaint with DNI Coates? I wouldn't have taken the job if I did. <laughs> no, sir. And how about with Sue Gordon? No, not at all. I don't believe, uh, to the best of my ability, I do not think that either Director Coates or our principal deputy, Sue Gordon, have any sense whatsoever about this whistleblower complaint or that Michael Atkinson had it. Before your current role, uh, did you discuss Ukraine with President Trump? No, Congressman. I, uh, haven't discussed, uh, I haven't discussed Ukraine with anybody. Let me put it to you that way. You haven't discussed uh, Ukraine with anybody in your current role as the acting DNI? Well, as we uh, intelligence reports, we, you know, we, we've got uh, about 190 countries out there, so whatever the uh, president's daily brief is and matters that pertain to that, but as far as intelligence equities uh, in that region right now, 
This has just not been something that has come to my attention in the six weeks uh, that I've been the acting DNI. Um, now, turning to the whistleblower and the inspector general, you, you don't know the identity of the whistleblower, right? Congressman, I do not, and I've made it my business to make sure that I do. Correct. That. And you don't know his political affiliation, obviously. I do not. I do not know this individual. Or her political affiliation. And of course, you believe that the whistleblower was operating in good faith. I do. And without bias. I don't know about that. I do not know about that. I do believe that the But you have no reason to believe that he or she was acting with bias, correct? I just believe that the whistleblower was acting in good faith. But you have no reason to believe that the person was biased. I would not know whether he biased or not biased, sir. I just don't know. And of course, you will do everything you can to protect the whistleblower from any attempts to retaliate against him or her, correct? I will not permit the whistleblower to be subject to any retaliation or adverse consequences for going to the IG. I am absolutely committed to that. And unlike yes. the whistleblower, you do know the Inspector General, yes, obviously. Yes, and I hold him in high esteem. And like the whistleblower, he also operated in the highest faith, right? I believe that Michael Atkinson, uh, yes, yes, and, yes. And interestingly, Mr. Atkinson was actually appointed by President Donald Trump, right? Yes, he was. He's a presidential appointee. At what lends real credibility to the whistleblower's complaint is the fact that Mr. Atkinson, an appointee of the president, would actually bring forward a complaint against his boss. And that's something that is especially courageous. What I want to hear from you is that you will also do everything you can to protect Mr. Atkinson from potential retaliation. C Congressman, Absolutely. Very good. Now, the White House released a memorandum of telephone conversation from the July 25th, 2019 call, right? I believe that was what was uh, transmitted yesterday morning, sir. And they call that a telcon in the jargon of these memoranda. Is that right? I, I'm, I'm familiar. This is the first time I've ever seen uh, the uh, transcript of a presidential conversation with the foreign leader. Okay, have you been? Telcon would be short for telephone conversation, though. Exactly. And have you been uh, a party to a uh, conversation between the president and a foreign leader on a phone call? When I am in the office to provide the intelligence brief to the president, some foreign head of state might call in. The president may either ask us to leave or just stay there for a brief call from time to time. Yes, sir. And there are note takers who actually scribble down furiously what's being said if, on those if, calls. If they are note takers, they would not be in the room Oval Office uh, with us. They might be uh, listening somewhere else, sir. Like from the Situation Room. Right. And in or, this or where, I don't know, but somewhere within the White House, yes. And, and within this particular um, situation, uh, maybe more than a dozen people were on the phone call. In that's, the that's the allegation, yes. And they were all taking notes, presumably. If they're good public servants, yes, Congressman. Were you t and, and were you uh, ever a party to a call where um, the notes that you took uh, were then uh, given to someone at the White House for uh, keeping? I, I have never been party to any call other than my own. I would take notes for my own at my level or as the director of National Intelli National Counterterrorism Center, but I have never been privy to a conversation of the president where I would be involved in taking notes. It would just be happenstance. I happened to be there, and he felt comfortable enough to leave me for a brief conversation. But it's not anything that I would be in that office particularly uh, for that matter. Thank you for your service. Well, thank you, Congressman, very much. Thank you. And I'd like to recognize the ranking member for any final questions that he would have. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. McGuire, I just want to thank you. Uh, for your attendance here today. Congratulations for surviving legal word challenge charade today. Uh, I expect hopefully we'll see you behind closed doors like this is supposed to be done. Uh, and I would just uh, urge my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, if they would like to impeach the president, uh, they need to go to the floor of the House and actually call for a vote. Uh, the Intelligence Committee is not an appropriate place to uh, try articles of impeachment. So there is a process in the Constitution that I would advise you all follow. In the meantime, Director McGuire, I, am, I want to apologize to you for uh, being accused of crimes that you have not committed. Uh, it's totally inappropriate uh, behavior for anyone to accuse someone that served four decades like you. I hope you do not have to go through this any longer. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member. I appreciate it, sir.
Director, uh, I have a few more questions. <clears throat> Just to follow up, because I thought I heard you say a moment ago that uh, you had no communication with the President on the subject of Ukraine. Um, did I understand you to say that? I, I have not particularly had any conversation with anyone on the subject of Ukraine that didn't deal with the matter that we have right now uh, in regard to uh, the whistleblower complaint. So um, I, not particularly with the Office of Legal Counsel as far as mentioning Ukraine or as far as um, uh, the, um, uh, the Justice Department. All I did was send the documents forward. The allegations are in there, and you know, I've just let the documents speak for themselves. So you're saying that you did not have any conversation on the subject of Ukraine that did not involve this complaint? That that's correct, sir. I mean, I mean, I've been in the acting DNI for six weeks. They, I have. I, I'm just trying to understand because that is suggestive that you did have a conversation involving the complaint with the president. No, no, no. Um, that is not what I said, sir. Okay. Um, Director, you mentioned early on when we were uh, on the subject of what the Inspector General was able to investigate or not investigate, whether the President is within the intelligence community or subject to the intelligence community. And by the way, the statute doesn't require that the subject of the complaint be within the intelligence community. It requires the whistleblower to be an employee or detailee, it doesn't require that the subject, the person complained of, be an employee of the intelligence community. But you have adopted an interpretation by the Justice Department that essentially says the president is above the director, therefore the president is not subject to the jurisdiction of the director, therefore it doesn't meet the definition of urgent concern, therefore the inspector general is done. Chairman Inspector Chairman. General can't investigate anymore. That's the Inspector General's reading of the Department opinion, that he is no longer allowed to investigate this. Is that your reading as well? Chairman, um, not necessarily the President, but the allegation has to relate to the funding, administration, and operation of an intelligence activity within the responsibility and the authority of the Director of National Intelligence. Okay, well, I'm just this trying to get to whether the President is somehow beyond the reach of the law. No, sir, the, the, no, no the, person in this country is beyond the reach well, of the law. Well, I, I, that's the way it should be, but I'm trying to figure out whether that's the way it is as a practical fact. Um, the Inspector General believes that based on the opinion that you requested of the Department of Justice, he is no longer allowed to look into this because it doesn't meet the definition of an urgent concern because it involves the President. Um, is that your understanding of the Department opinion as well? that the Inspector General no longer has jurisdiction to look into this? It is my understanding that both the Inspector General and I and my team are waiting for, the, we, we were waiting for the resolution of executive privilege to be determined. It is now no longer executive privilege. I'm not sure exactly what the statute has as far as what Michael can do, but we also are looking for a way, now, Executive, if, if, if I did not send it forward, as you know, uh, under uh, urgent concern within the seven days, then the statute would allow the whistleblower to come to you and still be protected. Yeah, uh, Director, but because my, my, not, my, my, we, we, are, we are accommodating. My, my point is this. The D Department of Justice has said, because this doesn't meet the statutory definition, because this involves the president, the inspector general has no jurisdiction to investigate. Now, if this inspector general has no jurisdiction to investigate because the president is above the agency, no inspector general has jurisdiction to investigate. That's the, that is the effect of that opinion. Which, do you disagree? I believe that the opinion was based on the reading of the statute and whether or not the situation here is compliant and comes underneath the statute. The Office of Legal Counsel opinion was that based on the criteria that you're required to have in order to support this legal statute, it does not. And he also said that because of that, it is not a matter of the intelligence community. But once again, yes, he well, said, that, 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 however, you may go forward, and that's I have. The, that's the key issue, Director. 
because it involves the president, it does not involve the intelligence community. That is the sum and substance. And the effect of that is the Inspector General has told us that he no longer has jurisdiction to investigate. And by the logic of that opinion, nor does any other Inspector General. Now, as you point out, this was referred to the Justice Department, it was referred to the FBI and Justice Department. That department under Bill Barr, and with breathtaking speed, decided there's nothing to see here. It decided that we don't believe that this constitutes a violation of the campaign finance laws, and therefore, we're not authorizing an investigation. The FBI is not authorized to investigate any of this. Any of this. So the IGs can't do it. According to the Department of Justice, the FBI can't do it because it doesn't meet their threshold that makes it worthy investigation. So at this point, only this committee and this Congress is in a position to investigate. And I want to ask you, going to the whistleblower complaint, whether you believe these allegations are worthy investigation. The whistleblower says, I have received information from multiple U.S. government officials that the President of the United States is using the power of his office to solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 U.S. election. You would agree that should be investigated, would you not? Chairman, the horse has left the barn. You have all of the information. You have the whistleblower complaint. You have the letter from the ICIG. You have the Office of Legal Counsel opinion. Yes, but and you uh, have yes, we do. But would you agree that I if there is a serious, there's incredible going to be an investigation, that you agree there should be an investigation? I believe that it is a matter to be determined by the chair and this committee. Well, I'm asking you as a career um, military officer, someone who I greatly respect and I admire your service to the country. Do you believe if there is a credible allegation by a whistleblower corroborated by apparently multiple U.S. government officials that the President of the United States is using the power of his office to solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 election, do you believe that should be investigated? I don't believe it was corroborated by other folks. The whistleblower says that he spoke or she spoke to about a dozen other people. This is secondhand information. Y I'm, not, yes, but I'm the, not criticizing the whistleblower. Yes, but the, but, the Inspector General but, took those two weeks, as you well told us, to corroborate that information. Now, we don't know which, if any, of these officials the Inspector General spoke to and found it credible. And you've told us that you have no reason to believe otherwise. Am I right? I had no reason to doubt a career Inspector General uh, lawyer in his determination on whether or not it was credible. That is something for Michael to determine. And, and, and let me ask you this. The whistleblower also says over the past four months, more than half a dozen U.S. officials informed me of various facts related to this effort to seek foreign interference. You would agree that we should speak to those half a dozen U.S. officials, would you not? I think that you have all the material that the, uh, the committee needs, and I think it's up to the committee how they think they need to proceed. Well, I'm asking your opinion. It As the head of my, our intelligence agencies, my, my, do you my, think that my, we should talk to those other people and find out whether the whistleblower is right? My responsibility to is to get you the whistleblower letter, the complaint, and the other information released. I have done my responsibility. That is on the shoulders of the legislative branch and this committee. Well, let me, let me ask you this, Director. The whistleblower also says, I am also concerned that these actions pose risks to U.S. national security and undermine the U.S. government's efforts to deter and counter foreign interference in U.S. elections. You would agree, if there's a credible allegation along those lines, that we should investigate it? I agree that if there was an election interference, the complaint is not about election interference. It was about a classified, confidential, uh, uh, diplomatic conversation. Involving election the interference by the president, sought by the president. That doesn't take it out of the realm of seeking foreign assistance. It makes it all the more pernicious. Wouldn't you agree? I, 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 as I said, I don't disagree with the IGIC's assessment that it was a credible matter. The whistleblower further says, namely, he the president sought to pressure Ukrainian leader to take actions to help the president's 2020 re-election bid. You would agree that that should be investigated? 
Not necessarily, sir. I mean, as far as it was investigated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. No, it wasn't. Yes, it, it went to the... No, the, 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 the Department of Justice concluded that this wouldn't violate the election laws. Now, no, so one, it, no one can understand how they could reach that conclusion after the two years we've been through, but nonetheless, they didn't authorize the FBI to investigate it. You would agree someone should investigate this, wouldn't you? I referred it, if I didn't, I would not have referred it to the Justice Department and to the FBI. Well, I, I, then I'm glad that we're in agreement. The whistleblower says they told me that there was already discussion ongoing with the House lawyers about how to treat the call because of the likelihood in the officials retelling they had witnessed the president abuse his office for personal gain. You would agree that that should be investigated, wouldn't you? I, all I know is that that's the allegation. Right, sure. and it's credible and therefore should be investigated, right? Well, it, it, again, it is hearsay, secondhand information. It should come to this committee for further investigation. Thank you. And I, I mean, you have it. You I, have the documents. I, I just wanted to confirm that we're in agreement that you think the committee should investigate it. The whistleblower also says Donald Trump expressed his conviction that the new Ukrainian government will be able to quickly improve Ukraine's image and complete the investigation of corruption cases that have held back cooperation between Ukraine and the United States. This is the whistleblower citing the Ukrainian readout. You would agree that if the Ukrainian readout, when they're talking about corruption cases, is talking about investigating Biden and his son, and that that has held back, the, the failure to do that has held back cooperation between our two countries, that should be investigated, right? That's of a national Chairman security Chief, dimension. I, I don't agree with, with any of that. What, I, I did not agree that it should be investigated. What I said was that I complied with my requirement to send you the documents. Well, I, 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 to I, this committee, and that it is up to the chair, the I, ranking member, and this committee members to decide what to do with that information. Uh, I'm in I, no position I, well, to tell the chair or the I, committee to do an investigation okay. or not do an investigation. I, I, okay. I, I find it remarkable that the Director of National Intelligence doesn't think credible allegations of someone seeking foreign assistance in a U.S. election should be investigated. Um, let me ask you this. The whistleblower further says, in the days following the phone call, I learned from multiple U.S. officials that senior White House officials had intervened to lock down all the records of the phone call. Do you have any reason to believe that the whistleblower's allegation there is incorrect? I have no idea whether it is correct or incorrect, sir. I Someone really... should find out, though, right? Excuse me? Someone should find out if it's correct, don't, shouldn't they? I don't know if that is an incorrect allegation. I mean, I just do not know. Again, that, that is the work, that is the business of the executive branch of the White House and the office of the White House. Well, corruption is not the business, or it shouldn't no, be, of the White they, House or anyone in it. What the White House decides to do with their privileged communications and information, I believe, is the business of the White House. Do you believe that's true even if that communication involves crime or fraud? I'm sure you're aware that any there's, a, there's an fraud. exception to any claim of privilege. The privilege can't be used to conceal no. crime or fraud. As I said before, any crime or fraud or instances of wrongdoing should be referred to the Justice Department for investigation, as I did. The whistleblower further alleges that White House officials told the whistleblower they were directed by White House lawyers to remove the electron electronic transcript, that is, of the call from the computer system in which such transcripts are typically stored. And instead, it was loaded into a separate electronic system that is used, otherwise used to store and handle classified information of a specially sensitive nature. One White House official described this act as an abuse of the electronic system. I do not know whether similar measures were taken to restrict access to other records of the call, such as contemporaneous handwritten notes taken by those who listened, and we should find out, shouldn't we? Um, Chairman Schiff, when I received the letter from Michael Atkinson on the 26th of August, he concurrently sent a letter to the Office of uh, White House Counsel uh, asking uh, the White House Counsel to uh, control and keep any information that pertained to uh, that um, uh, phone call on the 25th. It was a lengthy letter. Michael would be able to address it better. But I do believe that the ICIG, I know that the ICIG has sent a letter to the uh, White House Counsel requesting that they keep all of that information. But you would agree that if there's a credible allegation from this credible whistleblower that White House officials were moving these records into a system that was not 
designed for that purpose in an effort to cover up essentially potential misconduct, that, that ought to be looked into. You would agree with that, wouldn't you? I, to the best of my knowledge, when this allegation came forward, this whistleblower complaint on the 12th of August, uh, I have no idea what the timeline was uh, as far as whether or not the White House, the National Security Council, or anybody involved in that conversation, what they did with the transcripts, where they put them, I just have absolutely no knowledge, nor the timeline of that, Chairman. It is not something that would be under um, my authority or responsibility. The whistleblower makes a, a series of allegations involving Mr. Giuliani, cites a report in the New York Times about his planned trip to Ukraine to press the Ukrainian government to pursue investigations that would help the president in his 2020 re-election bid. You would agree that if the president was instructing his personal lawyer to seek, again, foreign help in a U.S. presidential election, that that would be improper. I, I believe Mueller described such efforts to seek foreign assistance as unethical, unpatriotic, and very possibly criminal. Would you agree with Director Mueller that, that to seek foreign assistance that way would be unethical, unpatriotic, and very possibly a violation of law? I believe that uh, Mr. Giuliani is the president's personal lawyer. And whatever conversation that the president has with his personal lawyer, I would imagine would be by client attorney of privilege. I am in no position to criticize the president of the United States on how he wants to conduct that. And I have no knowing of what Mr. Giuliani does or does not do. Um, let me ask you about the last couple allegations of the whistleblower. I learned from U.S. officials that on or around 14 May, the President instructed Vice President Pence to cancel his planned travel to Ukraine to attend President Zelensky's inauguration on 20 May. Secretary of Energy Rick Perry led the delegation instead. According to these officials, it was also made clear to them that the President did not want to meet with Mr. Zelensky until he saw how Zelensky, quote, chose to act, unquote, in office. I do not know how this guidance was communicated or by whom. I also do not know whether this action was connected with the broader understanding described in the unclassified letter that a meeting or phone call with the President and President Zelensky would depend on whether Zelensky showed the willingness to play ball. Do you know whether Mr. Pence, Vice President Pence's trip was pulled because of an effort to find out first whether Ukraine was willing to play ball? Um, Chairman Schiff, no, I do not. I have no knowledge of any of that until this information came to me uh, uh, from the ICIG. I have absolutely no situation awareness or no knowledge of any of those facts. Would you agree that if the Vice President's trip was canceled in order to put further pressure on Ukraine to manufacture dirt on Mr. Biden, that that would be unethical, unpatriotic, and potentially a crime? I do not know why the Vice President of the United States did not do that. I do know what the allegation was within the whistleblower complaint, and I don't know whether that allegation is accurate or not, Mr. Chairman. Finally, the whistleblower says, on July 18, an Office of Management and Budget official informed departments and agencies that the President earlier that month had issued instructions to suspend all U.S. security assistance to Ukraine. Neither OMB nor the NSC staff knew why this instruction had been issued. Senator McConnell said the other day that he spoke with the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State and he didn't know why the instruction had been given. Doesn't that strike you as suspicious, Director, that no one on the national security staff, no one in the senior leadership apparently of the party here in Congress that had approved the aid, understood why the president was suspending A, doesn't that strike you as just a little suspicious? Chairman Schiff, I'm just unaware, to be honest with you, how those decisions are made. And it, once again, I, I just I have no situation awareness of what happened well, with the if, holding of if, the funding from OMB. A, as a military man, if this military aid was withheld from an ally that is fighting off Putin's Russia, and it was done so to be used as leverage to get dirt in a U.S. political 
campaign. Don't you think that should be investigated? I have no reason to believe, I do not understand, I have no situational awareness if that was uh, withheld or why it was withheld, Mr. Chairman. Well, I can tell you, we are going to find out. Um, Director, I want to thank you uh, for your attendance today. I want to thank you again for your service. As my colleague uh, underscored, Mr. Welch, and I completely share his sentiment, no one has any question about your devotion to the country. No one has any question about your acting in good faith. I want to make that very clear. I think you're a good and honorable man. Like my colleagues, I don't agree with the decisions you made. I, I agree with the Inspector General's view of the law. And I'm deeply concerned about the message this has sent to other whistleblowers about whether this system really works. If the subject of a complaint can stop that complaint from getting to Congress, then the most serious complaints may never get here. And I want to thank the whistleblower for their courage. They didn't have to step forward. Indeed, we know from the whistleblower complaint there are several others that have knowledge of many of the same events. And I would just say to those several others that have knowledge of those events, I hope that they too would show the same kind of courage and patriotism that this whistleblower has shown. We are dependent on people of good faith to step forward when they see evidence of wrongdoing. The system won't work otherwise, and I, and I have to say to our friends in Ukraine who may be watching, just how distressing it is that as their country fights to liberate itself from, from Russian oppression, as it fights to root out corruption in, in their own country, that what they would be treated to by the President of the United States would be the highest form of corruption in this country. That the President of the United States would be, instead of a champion of democracy and human rights and the rule of law, would instead be reinforcing a message with the new Ukrainian President who was elected to root out corruption, that instead the message that President would be, you can use your Justice Department, just call Bill Barr, you can use our Justice Department to manufacture dirt on an opponent, that that's what democracy is. You can use foreign assistance, military assistance, vital assistance as a lever to get another country to do something unethical. The idea that, that a, a fellow democracy, a struggling democracy, would hear those messages from the President of the United States. I just want to say to the people of Ukraine, we support you in your fight with Russia. We support you in your struggle for democracy. We support you in your efforts to root out corruption. And what you are witnessing and, and what you are seeing in the actions of this president is not democracy. It is the very negation of democracy. This is democracy. What you saw in this committee is democracy as ugly as it can be, as personal as it can be, as infuriating as it can be. This is democracy. This is democracy. I thank you, Director. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if we, if we can allow the minister to the room. Um. Totally unprecedented. That's how the acting director of national intelligence described the whistleblower complaint over President Trump's dealings with Ukraine. Acting DNI director Joseph McGuire just wrapped up three hours of testimony before the House Intelligence Committee. You're watching live coverage from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey and you see uh, everyone leaving the hearing room there uh, in the Rayburn building. A hearing that was about a whistleblower complaint but also really kicks off what's essentially an impeachment process. Joining me here in the Washington Post studio, Shane Harris, intelligence and national security reporter and Amber Phillips, reporter for The Fix. Thanks so much to both of you. Um, I want to talk about the whistleblower complaint because that is part and parcel with, with really what happened today. Shane, what stood out to you, though, in this hearing? Did, did, did we learn anything from the actual process of the hearing today? Well, I think we learned a couple of interesting process points. Mm -hmm. I mean, one being that at the end of the day, this was 
the acting director of national intelligence McGuire's decision not to go to the White House or not to go to Congress. I mean, nobody explicitly said to him, don't do this. Now, there were serious executive privilege issues he had to get into. But that's all the process, really. The real meat of this hearing, I think, was about getting out the allegations that are contained in this whistleblower complaint. No one is second guessing that Joe McGuire did what he thought was right. What they really wanted to use this opportunity to was get to what this whistleblower is alleging. It's interesting because DNI McGuire said, you know, I was new on the job. I, I was still using Garmin, yeah. like, right. in other words, trying, trying to use like GPS to get to work. Right. I had to figure things out, and that's why I didn't push, push this forward right away, Amber. So he's trying to explain why he wanted to have a deliberative process and why this wasn't immediately turned over to Congress. Um, but Democrats did not find that to be acceptable. Right. What Democrats were arguing is like, okay, you followed the protocol you thought was right. However, you failed to take in context the political moment right now. Did you not think through that the complaint, you know, lists the President of the United States and the head of the Justice Department, uh, what it would mean to go to these guys, um, given what Democrats feel like they've seen, uh, you know, the President and the White House trying to stop anything from going to Congress at any level. Uh, regardless of something that's explosive. Yeah, we use the word unprecedented, and, and I think every corner here, Republicans would call this unprecedented in their own way, Democrats would, would also use that word, and then the Director of National Intelligence used it as well. Mm -hmm. I, I want to show an exchange between Adam Schiff, the Chairman, and uh, acting DNI McGuire. Let's watch this. Were you aware that the White House Counsel has taken the unprecedented position that the privilege applies to communications involving the President, um, when he was president, involving the president when he wasn't president, involving people who never served in the administration, involving people who never served in the administration even when they're not even talking to the president. Were you aware that that is the, the unprecedented position of the White House, the White House you went to for advice about whether you should turn over a complaint involving the White House? Mr. Chairman, as I said in my opening statement, I believe that everything here in this matter is totally unprecedented. Amber, when Acting DNI McGuire f talked about unprecedented a lot, though, today. He was referring to something a little more subtle the fact that this whistleblower complaint was, he says, not necessarily coming from someone um, in the Intelligence Committee who witnessed things firsthand. Um, whereas, of course, Chairman Schiff is like, this is unprecedented in terms of the comportment of a president and what this means politically and everything else. Um, what, was, what was the acting director trying to communicate to Congress today? I think he was trying to communicate that I, he didn't have a rule book for what to do. Like normally, it, you know, the whistleblower law is set up to protect um, complaints about like a bad acting middle manager. Uh, when it's against the President of the United States and the Attorney General, like wh he didn't have a rule book for what to do. So he was just trying to do his best was what he's trying to say. Yeah, I think that's right. And you saw really in the end here where McGuire made clear that he was trying to get this information to Congress. And I think he's, I think people believe he's a good faith actor, essentially saying, I am the Director of National Intelligence. I report to the President of the United States. I don't investigate the President of the United States. He's my boss, not the other way around. And I think kicking it very much over to Congress that this is your job as the co-equal branch of government, as the legislature, to investigate the executive, which, by the way, was what people were saying all throughout the Russia probes and the Mueller uh, investigation. So we're kind of hearing that theme come up again. In this case, you know, now a Democratic-controlled Congress, Adam Schiff seems very eager <laughs> to investigate this. And as much as I think that McGuire was getting sort of badgered by these questions from Democrats, um, I think that they also understand that he is kind of someone who is stuck in the middle here a bit. And at the end of the day, let's be clear, we got the complaint from the whistleblower. We got all of the correspondence released. We got the OLC opinion from the Justice Department. All of this information has not only been given to Congress, it's been made public. We're sitting here reading it. That is also unprecedented. All right, let's, oh, so go ahead, Amber. Was, that was the, kind of McGuire's parting shot, right? Yeah. It was like, you got what you wanted. Yeah, <laughs> now go investigate yeah, it. Leave Chef me keeps alone. saying, you know, do you think it should be investigated? And the message is, yes, go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the complaint, because while this hearing is certainly significant, the fact that we actually finally saw the whistleblower complaint this morning, just as the hearing was about to kick off, really changed the, the whole news story. And Shane, I know that you're the primary writer reporting on all of this today for the Washington Post. Um, one thing that stood out to us, and I know you've been tweeting about it this morning, is this question of whether or not uh, 
it was appropriate to lock down the records of right. this call. Right. What does it mean to lock down the records of the call, and why would that normally be done? So what appears happened here is that when, records are always made of calls that the president has with foreign leaders, some of them more detailed than others, uh, and they're obviously sensitive and they're held within a they're held within a computer network in the White House. What happened here, according to this whistleblower, is that someone made the decision to move that onto a more secure system that is traditionally used for highly classified information, but in this case appears to be used in order to restrict the number of people who had access to that information. So essentially, you know, mishandling it, I think the whistleblower would say here. That speaks, I think, to some kind of consciousness among White House officials that there was something problematic or embarrassing or maybe even incriminating in that conversation that they wanted to shield from people so that the distribution was more closely held so that this wouldn't leak so that other people in the administration wouldn't see it. A lot of these memos that are made of conversations that, com that the president has with foreign leaders go all throughout the government in what's called the interagency. So I think this speaks to the White House realizing you know there's something troubling that we want to shield in this conversation with the president of Ukraine and President Trump. What else did you learn from this whistleblower complaint that stood out to you that, that perhaps we didn't know just from the readout or the rough transcript of the conversation President Trump had with the Ukrainian president? Because we saw that yesterday, but there's more in this. Yeah, one thing I think we've learned is that the whistleblower is not the only witness to these events. This person makes clear, look, I don't have firsthand information about this, but there, I think he, said, he or she says, there are more than a half dozen other U.S. officials who have informed me of various facts related to this effort. You know, if we were writing this story at the Washington Post and you say 12 sources in the White House mm -hmm. tell us, that'd be a, a pretty uh, a significant story. So clearly there are more people in the White House who saw this. That also speaks to me to a group of people who are maybe having discussions about what they're seeing, uh, that there is some kind of... Uh, um, broader awareness and it's not just focused on this one individual. Um, <clears throat> clearly the call, uh, the, the, the complaint also strongly centers on this uh, July 25th phone call that President Trump had with President Zelensky and we, we knew about this from previous reporting but it also goes into great detail taking public records and essentially trying to create a narrative that I think comes away making it look like Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal attorney, is very much kind of a conduit or a sort of emissary to the Ukrainians as as alleged here, the president is trying to pressure them into investigating his political opponents. So Rudy Giuliani, I think, plays a really key piece in this. And I think that's something we're going to be looking really closely at. All right, Shane Harris, uh, reporter, we're going to let you get back to work since you are writing this big story. Um, stay with me, Amber, though. We're going to go to Rhonda Colvin on Capitol Hill. Rhonda's been watching the hearing. She's been inside the hearing room. What stood out to you? Libby, what stood out to me in the hearing room is that right away this morning, Adam Schiff went right into questioning uh, DNI McGuire about what he knew and when he knew it and how, when did he go to the White House to discuss this whistleblower claim. Adam, Adam Schiff wanted to establish that the witness did go to the White House first, the witness being the subject of the whistleblower's complaint, or the White House being the subject of the whistleblower's camp, uh, uh, claim, and he really wanted the room and America to see that um, the uh, the DNI uh, did go to Trump and uh, Trump's counsel to discuss this matter. Now, uh, Democrats they stayed along uh, with that type of cross-examining, trying to lay out the case here. We also had Republicans sticking to the idea that this is all about leaks. This is about leaks to the media, and that's what's wrong about this whole thing. So those are two things that happened throughout that, uh, all lines of questioning. The other thing that stood out to me is, and I don't know how many times you were able to see a wide shot, but through the end, uh, probably about 30 minutes until the end, there weren't many Republicans left in the room. Many of them left uh, and did not return. Now, you may not be able to discern much from that, you know, Capitol Hill is a very busy place. There are other meetings going on, but uh, Republicans have been very quiet after this is over, and I do know that they're not doing any press availability after this. So um, it remains to be seen how this will play out, but we will be here to monitor it, and I'm sure this is not the last of this case. Back to you. Rhonda Colvin, thank you so much. Live on Capitol Hill. We're now joined here by Matt Zapatosky, who's been
been covering this uh, from the Justice Department angle and the national security angle. Of course, Amber Phillips here writing for The Fix. Matt, since you're new to the table here, um, big takeaways uh, from today. And, and were you seeing more pop out of the hearing or, or is really the news story today what's in this complaint? I think the complaint is definitely the news story. I, I thought it was remarkable how he was so unwilling to endorse any kind of allegation in the complaint, kept stressing these are allegations. I have no knowledge of this. I have no knowledge of this. Wouldn't even sort of commit to saying, I think it should be investigated. He, of course, referred this to the FBI and Justice Department, who declined to investigate it. And he's kind of all over the map on whether he even personally thought it should be investigated, which is a little weird. If you make a referral, you would think that you might be trending that way, which at one point he said, and then sort of walked it back and said, well, I don't know if it should be investigated mm -hmm. or not. So I think definitely the big news today is what is in the substance of that whistleblower complaint. Director McGuire, Amber, did have to try to, to walk a line, which we expected him to try to do as the, as the acting director of national intelligence, where he doesn't divulge too much information. But a point of contention with Democrats was they wanted to know, did you talk about this yeah. with President Trump? And the Democrats at one point were even saying, you don't have to tell us what you said, but just tell us, did you talk about it? And he would not speak to that at all. He said, everything I say to the president is uh, is confidential right yeah that gets to Matt's point that he was being extremely careful about like not trying to endorse what's in this whistleblower complaint and implicate his boss on this front um, de from Democrats perspective it was tough to tell like whether he was saying I'm not sharing anything I say with the president uh, from a precision of principle right like if I share with you just this simple fact about what I talked about then who knows what other conversations between intelligence chief and the president could come before Congress or whether he was using that as a way to like cover up something, some kind of conversation he had. That, that's where Democrats, like, I felt like were left shrugging and they were unable to uncover. Uh, Director McGuire kept saying, "I support whistleblowers." Like, and, you know, and he's like, "I have some work to do. I've got to, I've got to go back to my to my office and make sure that people know they can come forward and that there are protections." Um, but at the same time, it was, uh, I don't want to say it wasn't a full throated. Uh, message of support. I think he believes he's trying to send a, a, a strong message of support. But Democrats were raising some concerns about, well, if, if, if you are so loyal to the both the, the philosophy of how whistleblowing works and you are also loyal to this, uh, someone who works within the government, why wouldn't you have come to us right away? Why wouldn't you have come forward more quickly, Matt? Yeah, he did commit to protecting this whistleblower yeah. in particular and uh, the intelligence community inspector general if President Trump or allies were to make a move at those people. And he did seem to be sort of espousing the general idea mm -hmm. that I support whistleblowing. But Democrats, of course, as you say, are quite frustrated because it's like, if you support whistleblowing, why did you go first to the lawyers for the subject of this whistleblower's complaint? What advice did you think they were going to give you? The, and then why after that did you go to the Justice Department? Why didn't you do, as we in Congress feel the law requires, which is pass this thing to us. Why did you get in the way if you're so supportive of whistleblowers? He, and again, speaks to the point of him trying to walk a fine line, not wanting to endorse the whistleblower's complaint, upset the president, but also wanting, you know, speaking to the men and women, uh, you know, that are, are underneath him and in his work and letting them know, look, I support good government. I support your efforts to make our government good, uh, just as a general principle. At one point, or early on as well, Democrats asked him why didn't he speak out when um, President Trump maligned this whistleblower mm -hmm. as a political hack, mm -hmm. and he said, well, I did. I sent an internal agency note to say we support all whistleblowers. Um, but it was interesting there for Democrats to see McGuire put him on this pedestal and think, like, try to create conflict between him and President Trump and say, like, no, you need to have a more public-facing role mm -hmm. about all this, and he wasn't willing to do that. Of course, we don't know who the whistleblower is and just what information or how the whistleblower got the information was something Republicans are trying to, to pick at. And some Republicans focused on the whistleblower's statement that he or she learned about most of these events from colleagues rather than seeing it firsthand. Here's Representative Elise Stefanik, a Republican from New York. We'll get to that in just a moment, but I can do exactly what the Congresswoman did, which was she read from the complaint. So what she did was she went to the acting director and, and said, here's what the whistleblower writes. I was not a direct witness to most of the events described. And what she's trying to say is like, how do we know to trust this person if they actually didn't witness it 
themselves. So let's talk first, Amber, about the voice that this whistleblower is using. What intimacy or knowledge do we know they have? Uh, it's someone who has conversations with high-level officials on a regular basis, both within the White House and within the intelligence community. And that's what I feel like this whistleblower was really relying on. I think at one point here she says, you know, I like some of these conversations came up within the regular course of work that I might have with my portfolio and someone sharing with me intel about their portfolio to do my job. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one can assume from there the whistleblower like had a conversation red flag got raised and then try to paint this narrative. Mm. I'm sure Republicans will say, well look, these are secondhand conversations. How can we even believe that these conversations took place? The Inspector General ha had said that this person has some indicia of political bias. How can we know this? But we have some clues in there that they actually have sources, as we would say. They described this July 25th call. Now we've seen the actual dialogue from that call. And I thought the whistleblower's description, in just talking to people who had seen the, this, tr this rough transcript or heard the call, had a remarkably accurate account of what happened, accurately said that there was pressure with regard to the Bidens, also accurately said that there was pressure with regard to this separate investigation into the origins of the Russia probe, and if the DNC server is in Ukraine, I mean, that's a level of knowledge of this call that they admit they weren't on. They had to get that from people actually in the know, so I think that really shows this person is in touch with people in the know, and that gives some credibility to their other allegations that other officials are coming and expressing broad kind of concern. Ms. Stefani's questions did give us some insight into how Republicans may attack this and attack the whistleblower complaint, this idea that if the person doesn't have this direct knowledge, if, as it says, uh, they were not a direct witness, how can we trust it? How do, how do we know there, there's something there? What else did Republicans reveal is their strategy to discredit this? Uh, to conflate the definition of a whistleblower and a leaker, I saw Devin Nunes, the top Republican on the Intelligence Committee, do that in his opening mm -hmm. statement. Um, he talked about conversations with foreign leaders that had been leaked mm -hmm. uh, to the press. Australia, uh, Mexico, you probably reported on this too. <laughs> uh, Mexico mm -hmm. and Australia, and he said, and Ukraine's getting leaked as well. Like, like he really had this kind of deep state conspiracy theory about the intelligence community. Um, of course, the facts don't bear that out, like McGuire, testified that the whistleblower followed the all the protocol of the whistleblower law, which is to keep this secret. Like, like, had the process worked, arguably we wouldn't be reading this, right? The intelligence communities would. Um, so that's the line of attack I saw. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, is accusing the White House of a cover-up. That's the language that she is now using. And there's a question of just what Congress will be able to do in the coming hours, days, and weeks. Um, because they, they are not in Washington a whole lot for the rest of 2019, which seems yeah. kind of shocking, but between the Jewish holidays and other recesses where they plan to be out of town, back in their home districts, uh, Washington is gonna go through a real, real roller coaster of a lot of people here and then a lot of people gone. Um, there is a building effort to try to say, you should stay here, you should stay here and get something done. Republicans aren't gonna wanna do that though, Amber. No, and, and I saw yesterday that number two House Democrat also said, I think our, law, our lawmakers, our members should go back home and explain what's happening um, to constituents. That, that was his argument for why they shouldn't cut it. Um, for what that does for the momentum for impeachment hearings, I don't know, uh, it could be difficult for Democrats to sell why they're doing this when they don't, when they have a break and they don't have a chance like they did today to just air mm -hmm. all the alleged wrongdoing by the president. You know, we saw a poll come out as these allegations were being reported by Matt and others here at the Washington Post. And as people were learning about this, 57% of Americans still didn't think Trump should be impeached and removed from office. A lot of this is momentum, though, even with the right. reporting that leads us to this moment. You know, first there's a report that this complaint involves Trump, then it's Trump in Ukraine, then it's Trump pressuring U Ukraine on Biden. And that sort of steady drumbeat is what leads to the release of this rough transcript, to the release of the full whistleblower complaint, to today's hearing. There is an element of momentum here that will be lost if they return home. I mean, I would think in short order they would maybe want to get the whistleblower uh, himself or herself in front of them, maybe the inspector. General who would uh, more forcefully endorse some of the whistleblower's conclusion than McGuire did today, but if they just go home and sort of s talk, you know, on the stump to voters in their districts, while well, that might help them when elections, it could, uh, you know, 
undercut some of the momentum here that they, they seem to have right now. Now, what are you going to be watching for next steps moving forward with, with this this whole story? Not not just what the congressional role is, since Speaker Pelosi has launched an official impeachment inquiry, but but the the larger story of the whistleblower of this complaint uh, and how the White House is responding. I think our next reporting targets are kind of looking at the claims in the whistleblower complaint and not just the call, right? We have the transcript of the call. But the whistleblower mentions that this wasn't the first time, according to other officials, that the White House tried to move some transcript to a classified setting for political reasons as opposed to for national security reasons. So as a reporter, what the heck are those other times? Who are these officials that said that? Um, you know, of course we want to get to the bottom of, the Justice Department actually has a prosecutor, a U.S. attorney in Connecticut named John Durham, who is doing an investigation with, with respect to Ukraine. To what extent was that influenced either internally or externally by Rudy Giuliani pressure, or is it being influenced? So, I mean, there are a lot of uh, reporting targets on the facts here, and then Congress is going to do what Congress is going to do. I guess we'll just have to track that. Amber, what will you be watching for? How does Congress do what Congress is going <laughs> to do? They have a really, really tough job ahead of them. Um, like I said, majority of Americans don't support impeachment, and they need to make the argument why they should do this um, and why they should support it. And they don't have like a special select committee set up for impeachment. That sounds insidery, but I talked to a lawyer who was announced during the Clinton impeachment scandal yes yesterday, and he said, the, it's like impeachment light, what Nancy Pelosi is doing right now. They don't have like a dedicated staff and lawyers and lawmakers like full time focused on mm -hmm. developing, you know, articles of impeachment against the president. Um, so they, they have an uphill battle to try to convince the American public this is the right thing to do. And finally, uh, acting DNI McGuire, what, what, what does his life look like right now? I mean, Democrats treated him at times like a hostile witness, even as they said, We'd, we respect and admire your track record, your, your history of service. Their complaints are that he didn't move fast enough to get the information to Congress, and they're concerned that he's not being enough of a, uh, uh, a vocal supporter of the whistleblower, and also he's not willing to say, yeah, I, I think these things should be investigated. If there's an allegation of wrongdoing in a complaint like this, it should be looked into. That would be against the law. Um, but he also protected himself, Matt, as, as, as you said. Um, Republicans were totally supportive of him. Where does that leave his political future or his career at, at DNI right now? I think we were talking earlier about how he's only in this role because he's kind of last man standing. President Trump pushed out his sort of two predecessors, um, and he—you could see in in his in his testimony today that he is almost like in the job reluctantly. He joked that if he had known about the whistleblower complaint, he wouldn't have taken the job. That said, I didn't tell that was a joke or not. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. That said. I think that he at least today prevented some kind of catastrophic reaction from Trump to force mm -hmm. him out. He didn't say anything that would be so damaging to President Trump that President Trump would make a move against him. I'll be curious to see what congressional Democrats do. I'm sure they're a little bit disappointed in his testimony, but I don't know what other step they would take. He did come and he did talk. I don't think you're going to see this end in like contempt as you would for Bill Barr. Republicans were on, seemed to be very appreciative of him. Him, um, perhaps because he wasn't saying anything that was particularly damaging for Trump, so I wouldn't imagine they would want to take any steps against him. And Amber, he kept emphasizing how he is not a political player, mm -hmm. how he's a career person who's, who's worked his way up through the intelligence ranks. He seemed really frustrated that mm -hmm. he, one time he called himself the most famous man in America right now, and that his like 40 years of service through the military and the intelligence and law enforcement, he felt was being like dragged through the mud. Um, is not the first official in the Trump administration to feel that way. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Amber Phillips, Matt Zapatowski. Thanks for your time. Uh, and thank you for watching our coverage here at The Washington Post. For those of you who are not yet subscribers, you can take a moment to subscribe to The Post so we can keep you up to date on this developing story, which we'll be covering both in print as well as live here on broadcast. I'm Libby Casey. Thanks for watching.